When I first mooted the idea of a global fund, quite a lot of people laughed it off saying, there he goes again dreaming. You know, and I, I love dreams. It always starts with a dream. was a defining moment that brought the world together in a way that had never been seen before. Thanks to an inspirational demonstration of unshakable will and collaboration, we will rid the world of AIDS, TB, and malaria. Together, let's deliver on a promise to the next generation to end AIDS, TB, and malaria. We changed the course of history. That moment is not next week or next year or in five years. That moment is right now. You know, right now we're on track to end the scourge of HIV AIDS. That's within our grasp. And we have the chance to accomplish the same thing with malaria. Je ne laisserai personne sortir de cette pièce, ni quitter Lyon tant que les 14 milliards de dollars ne seront pas obtenus. This site reminds me every day of the extraordinary power of the human spirit. And the things that bind us are stronger than those that divide us. Where you live cannot decide whether you live. We succeed or fail together. You have made the impossible possible. It can be done. And if not us, who? And if not now, when? This is our fight. Join us to fight for what counts. What counts for me? What counts to me? What counts for me? What counts to me is saving lives. We need to defeat HIV, TB, and malaria. What counts for me is that nobody has to die because they are poor, because they are marginalized, because they are stigmatized. And what counts for me is to end malaria so that the children under five stop dying every minute. What counts for me is that it's important to end TB stigma and discrimination. What counts for me is a human rights approach to end AIDS by 2030. What counts for me is an increased investment for TB. What counts for me is... As a mother of three girls, I can live to see my girls have access to HIV prevention services. And what counts to me is to fight for gender equality. That we come together as a global community and ensuring, and ensuring everybody, everybody can, can access, access quality health care without, without exception. exception. So no mother loses her child to a mosquito bite. We need to invest more on TB program, especially for the community's programs and human rights. If there is the political will, we can actually end HIV AIDS by 2030. What counts for me is equitable access to health care. Is ensuring that no one dies from preventable diseases. What counts for me to build a healthier and safer world for all. What counts for me? What counts to me? What counts for me? What counts for me? Is saving 20 million more lives. In spite of the age, I'll rise up and 
and I'll do it a thousand times years ago the world was in crisis dealing with diseases that know no borders but we fought back a breakthrough for humanity the world created the, the global, global fund proving that hiv tuberculosis and malaria can and will be beaten Saving 50 million lives. Mothers, Fathers, children, brothers, friends, sisters, communities. But our fight is far from finished. And the world is in crisis. Once again. We must choose to fight for what counts. Today. Tomorrow. Now. Until the job is finished. Defeating HIV, TB, and malaria by, by 2030. 2030. Ending the inequity that still determines who lives and who dies. Protecting humanity from pandemics today and tomorrow. Uniting, Uniting the world to fight as one. With communities at the heart. With at least $18 billion, we can save 20 million more lives. Because who, if not us? And when, if not now? This is our fight. This is what counts. Lutter pour ce qui compte. Lutter pour ce qui importe. Pelea pour ce qui vale la peine. Moloan et les. C'est tout ça. C'est tout ça. Lutter pour ce qui importe. Lutter pour ce qui compte. Siempre se ve, se ve, se ve. Perjuangan untuk apa yang lebih penting. Kai noa guma kefe de ma. Strider for a blanc like us. Kijuan zeng miangue, amke jikyo. Lutter. Pour ce qui compte. Fight for what counts. Fight for what counts. Fight for what counts. Fight for what counts. Hello, everybody. You know what? This is New York City. You can do a better round of appreciation than that. Come on. I need to feel the energy. I need to feel the vibe. I need to feel the love, the connection. Because that was 
a powerful reminder of why we are all here today and why we're at it. Come on, put your hands together for Tone Wall of the New York City Gay Men's Chorus for their years uplifting performance. My name is Henry Bonsu. I'm a television and radio broadcaster from the UK and Ghana. I'm going to be your MC today. And I've got to say, it's a pleasure, a real pleasure to be here back in New York for the first time in three years. And that's why I'm delighted to say, honorable ministers, excellencies, distinguished guests, welcome to the seventh replenishment conference of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Welcome to New York City. Welcome to the iconic Gotham Hall. Isn't it amazing here? My God. Wow. And a very special thank you to our host, President Biden and the United States government. Thank you to Secretary Becerra of the Department of Health and Human Services, who is representing our host today and who has been a champion of the Global Fund's seventh replenishment. And thank you to Mayor Adams for welcoming us to New York City. Mayor Adams, thank you. We have an exciting afternoon in store for you. It's going to reflect on the remarkable impact of the Global Fund Partnership's 20-year history, as well as its vital role in the world today and in the future. We're going to hear from community leaders and advocates who will share their personal fight against HIV, TB, and malaria, and the incredible contributions they are now making to end these three diseases. And we'll hear from some of the leading global health experts representing governments, the private sector, civil society, and other partners. Now, it's got to be said, over the last two decades, the United States has been a leader in the fight against HIV, TB, and malaria, particularly through the work of PEPFAR, the President's Malaria Initiative and USAID. And in addition to hosting the seventh replenishment, President Obama hosted the Global Fund's fourth replenishment. That was in Washington, D.C. back in 2013. How many of you were there? Well, you want to show it. How many of you were there? Come on. I wasn't. My first one was in Montreal, Montreal, in 2016, and then Lyon, with Monsieur Macron, in 2019. But it's important to highlight the US's role because it's a founder contributor to the Global Fund, and it's the single largest supporter, actually, contributing one third of the organization's funding, and that amounts to more than 20 billion US, not Jamaican or Bayesian, they also use the dollar, US since 2002. Nothing wrong with the Bayesian dollar, I've spent plenty myself. But I'm now pleased at this point to introduce Secretary Becerra of the Department of Health and Human Services. Now throughout his career, the Secretary has been a strong champion of equitable access to health. Secretary Becerra, please take the floor. Henry, thank you so very much. Welcome everyone, especially if you've come a long distance. How many of you who are not from the US who are here present? Thank you. All right, how many of you had to travel more than 10 hours to get here? Oh my God. How many of you partied longer than it took you to get here? Uh, okay, uh, this is the big apple, I know, I know. Let me begin by saying to each and every one of you, thank you for your support for the seventh replenishment of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. It's an honor for me and for all of my colleagues from the U.S. government to host this seventh replenishment. And certainly on behalf of our president, President Joe Biden, I'd like to thank each and every one of you, especially if you'll do this a favor of thanking those in your home country who've been working with you. Please thank everyone here for your tireless work to end HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria. To our heads of state, ministers, private sector partners, civil society leaders, thank you. Thank you for supporting and leading in this global fund. And to Peter, 
to Peter Sands, our executive director. Thank you for the fight, for all the work you do to shape the vision, the strategy, and to implement when it comes to the Global Fund's activities, and certainly now as we prepare for the seventh replenishment. And certainly to our mayor of New York City, Eric Adams, for hosting us, for letting all these folks party for more than 10 hours. We want to say thank you very much for your support and dedication to what this is all about with the fund. This is an important moment in our fight. If you ask me what counts for me, I would say meeting the moment. If you ask me what counts, I would say to you, it is making sure that if we can try, we must. And if what counts for me is for those who are trying but aren't sure, it is that you must try to meet that moment. And that is why we're gathered here today. Because we know we can beat HIV. We know we can beat TB. We know we can beat malaria. And this year marks our 20th anniversary of trying to do exactly that. Since its inception, the Global Fund has invested more than 55 billion U.S. dollars. It has saved more than 44 million lives. It has reduced the combined death rate from all three of these diseases by more than half in the countries it is invested in. And more recently, the Global Fund has responded to the COVID-19 pandemic by launching the COVID-19 response mechanism back in April of 2020 to provide additional funds of some 4.3 billion U.S. dollars to more than 130 countries to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 and the pandemic. The U.S. is proud to be a founding contributor to the Global Fund, and it is its largest single donor, contributing nearly 20 billion U.S. dollars since 2002. According to UNAID, Every dollar that we invest in the fight against AIDS, TB, and malaria produces $31 in health and economic returns, meaning our investments yield a return that is so high in magnitude that Wall Street would blush. And so let us recognize what we have the power to do. These results are felt on the ground every day by people around the world who count on us. For example, when the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted health programs, including HIV services and STI services and testing in Guatemala, Ben K. Chin, an openly gay TV personality, journalist, and activist, was just one member of the LGBTQ community who felt isolated and vulnerable. But the Global Fund stepped up and was able to widely distribute self-testing kits to help people, including Ben, access important HIV testing and healthcare services amid the backdrop of the pandemic. A successful global fund replenishment will go a long way to helping people like Ben and put critical care in reach. In the U.S., the Biden-Harris administration has taken bold steps to leverage science, community care, and investments in successful programs to end the HIV epidemic. Quick example. Through the Ending the HIV Epidemic in the U.S. initiative, we aim to reduce the number of new HIV cases and infections in the U.S. by 75% by 2030, excuse me, by 2025, and then by 90% by 2030. The initiative has engaged nearly 20,000 people with HIV into care and treatment through what we call our Ryan White HIV AIDS program and has been a key component of the community health centers providing PrEP medications to nearly 40,000 individuals. Last year, on World AIDS Day, President Biden released our national HIV AIDS strategy to accelerate and strengthen our response to the HIV epidemic in the U.S. And the Office of National AIDS Policy released the Federal Implementation, implementation Plan, which outlines over 380 actions to be taken by our federal government and our agencies in partnership with communities and people like you to achieve our collective goals. And we're not stopping there. In March of this year, President Biden formally asked Congress to appropriate $2 billion for the Global Fund, 
with an intended pledge of $6 billion over the three years to support the seventh replenishment, demonstrating our readiness to match $1 for every $2 contributed by others. And in the past, the U.S. government contributed funding to mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and a pledge for the seventh replenishment. We hope many people in this room and around the world will join us and step up and fight as we march to replenishment to 20, September 21st. We will meet the moment. We must meet the moment. In the end, we're in that same boat. We just have to all row together in the same direction. And the more we do, the more lives we save. We want to ensure that people can live a normal, healthy life, regardless of geography or HIV status, that there is sufficient protection to prevent malaria, that there is widespread access to life-saving TB medication, and that there are sufficient financial resources to continue that life-saving work. Virus, infection, they know no borders, but they need our community support to be defeated. And that's why I am proud to be with you here today to continue our fight for better health outcomes and to help everywhere in the world. And so I say to you again, what counts for me is meeting the moment. President Biden will make sure that the U.S. meets the moment. Thank you all very much. listening hard to Secretary Becerra's speech, did I hear a figure of $6 billion? Yes. Run up by me again, $6 billion. Yes. Woo, come on, my word. We can't just let that land. Just listening hard, Secretary. $55 billion spent in 20 years. What a return on investment, hey? Bearing down on those three diseases by more than 50%, fantastic. And it's great to hear your rationale for why the US government has been such a strong supporter of the partnership. But I'm now pleased to introduce a passionate and long-standing champion of social justice and gender equality, the executive director of UNAIDS, Madame Winnie Bianyima. Madame Bianino hanging, Winnie Bianima. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today in Ukraine, people fleeing both war and viruses are showing up in overwhelmed clinics in the west of the country seeking treatment for drug-resistant TB. Today, in the Philippines, a young gay man facing criminalization is struggling to get access to the same HIV prevention drugs that are available down the street here in New York. Today, in my country, Uganda, a baby and a mother are likely to die of malaria. This is why we're here today. Thank you, Henry. I'm delighted to join Secretary Basera, Dr. Donald Kaberuka, Peter Sands, and everyone here today for the opening session of the Fight for What Counts campaign event. Peter, thank you for inviting me. I salute all the political leaders who have come here. And I have the honor to speak on behalf of the Secretary General Antonio Guterres and the whole of the United Nations family, including UNAIDS, the Joint Program on HIV AIDS. Let me start by commending President Biden and the US government for hosting this seventh replenishment conference. The United States has been the indispensable partner and investor in global health institutions and countries working to end AIDS, TB, and malaria. It also plays a vital 
leadership role in the global COVID-19 response. The fund is similarly indispensable, an indispensable part of a global ecosystem fighting these three pandemics. Global partners like ourselves at UNAIDS, like the Stop TB Partnership and the Rollback Malaria, depend on the distinctive model of the fund, while the fund too depends on our support in countries to deliver results. This unique partnership with strong country leadership supported by global fund investments of more than $55 billion has saved 50 million lives, as Secretary Basera has said. The combined death rate from HIV, TB, and malaria has been reduced by more than a half in countries where the Global Fund invests. These are important achievements and proof, positive proof of the life-saving potential of this partnership. But we're now at a critical moment. The COVID-19 pandemic has wiped off years of progress on poverty eradication. It has disrupted health services, resulted in a drop in immunization, immunization coverage for the first time this decade. Deaths from TB and malaria are increasing. Our recent Global AIDS report showed that there's rising new infections of HIV in countries where they had been dropping. So I want to be clear. Inequalities are driving pandemics. AIDS, TB, malaria, as well as COVID, as well as monkeypox. And future pandemics will also be driven by inequalities if we do not act. Where we ignore them, viruses fester. Inequality is growing, and this is harming our capacity to fight pandemics. A fiscal and debt crisis is hitting many developing countries, dramatically affecting their ability to deliver on urgently needed health investments. We know what to do. We do it. We work to get cutting-edge medicines to those who need them most not those who can afford to pay. We work collectively to improve human rights environments so people can trust public health systems and access services. We work together to shift gender norms to ensure that young women and girls have the power to control their own bodies and their health. This is pandemic response. The Global Fund is ready for this moment. Working with us at UNAIDS, with Stop TB, with Rollback Malaria and other partners, we are able to use the resources that Global Fund raises to harness science, to support communities, to engage across sectors to stop these diseases. The Global Fund must have sufficient resources. With a yield of investment of 1 to 31, it is the best investment in global health ever. And this week, every investor, every partner, every donor has a chance to leverage that investment to get the world back on track to end AIDS, TB, and malaria. It's equally critical to our efforts to build robust, resilient, inclusive health systems. Systems which integrate both disease-specific responses and pandemic preparedness and ensure equitable access for all. This will be our most strategic step to finally get ahead in our fight against current and future pandemics. The Global Fund's model of responsive, inclusive, and transparent funding will enable our collective success, but only if it's fully funded, only 
as Secretary Bacera says, we meet the moment. Only then we will deliver on the promise of ending AIDS, TB, and malaria, and make the world more equitable and safer from future threats. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bianima, for highlighting the intersection between gender equality and global health care. And indeed, um, your remarks underline how a successful seventh replenishment is crucial to achieving our goal of ending AIDS by 2030. Now on to our next speaker. Put your hands together warmly, energetically, nay, effusively for the chair of the Global Funds Board, Dr. Donald Kaburuka. It's been a very long time, how are you? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. You know, we're here to talk about the Global Fund, but we're actually here to talk about a global movement a global movement where all of us, governments, civil society, business, will continue the fight which just Winnie just mentioned. The fund is only a tool, but our fight is like a movement, a movement which has done quite a lot, but there's much more to do. You know, there's a famous person who said, that there are decades when nothing happens. Those decades, I would say, up to the year 2000. Decades. People are dying in villages, in schools, in factories. Mayhem. And then he said, there are weeks when decades happen. The day when the Global Fund was set up. What a difference it has made. Think of the world today without the Global Fund. Think of the millions of people around the world who have no access to drugs. Think of the children who are dying. Think of millions of orphans, some of whom I saw in many villages. Think of families where the head of the family was an eight-year-old because father and mother had died. Think of schools which were empty because teachers were dying. Those were days before the Global Fund was set up. Now we're here today, we're excited about what we've achieved, but we're also energized to see where all this is heading. And so I want to begin by thanking uh, Secretary for being here with us. Thank you very much. Mayor, for inviting us to your beautiful city. Ten years ago, about ten years ago, President Obama hosted an event like this in Washington. Uh, what an event it was. And it concretized over a decade and a half of cooperation with the U.S., which has continued. Now this week we are here under the leadership of President Joe Biden, and many other leaders in the U.S. I listened yesterday to a speech by Senator Lindsey Graham to Nancy Pelosi. Amazing. I just invite you to say what they said about the Global Fund, what they said about the fight in which we are involved. They got it right. Nancy Pelosi said, the moment I got in Congress, I was talking about fighting HIV AIDS. Senator Lindsey Graham said, this is the best investment governments have ever made. Just look at what they said yesterday. And so we cannot but be thankful to the people of the U.S. and New York City for what they are doing, for this movement to fight the three diseases. Two years ago, we could not have met here. We couldn't. We could not even have traveled to New York because of COVID. And as Winnie just said, COVID set us back many years. But think of the fact that as COVID was ravaging the world, Millions of people around the world were suffering 
the same pandemics we're discussing today, malaria, TB, and HIV AIDS, silent victims of some of these terrible diseases. They may not have appeared on TV, they may not have caught the headlines, but these are the millions of lives which we're here to save. You know, uh, I'm reminded of uh, what someone said that uh, I can't recall who this is, who said that there are diseases uh, of the poor, and often those, because they're diseases of the poor, they don't see the headlines. But actually, because they don't see the headlines, all right, people think they have disappeared. No. HIV is still with us. TB is killing millions of people. Malaria is still killing half a million children in Africa today, as we speak, under fives. So the fight is still here. And this is why this movement is important. So this week we are here to try and raise $18 billion. But actually, we need much more than $18 billion. The countries concerned will have to raise much more money. And we need more than money. We need a coalition of forces around technology, around data, around logistics to get this done. So this is an incredibly important week for us here in New York. And we are happy to see that all of you here who have been involved in this movement continue to be involved. So I look forward to working with you this week to galvanize efforts, imagination, so that we continue to get work done fighting for what counts. What counts are millions of lives around the world, but it's more than millions of lives around the world. It is our societies, their stability, their well-being. It is humanity and its fate. And I know we can, we can succeed. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Dr. Kabaruka, you've reminded us all about the power of partnership and global solidarity, especially as we appear to be in one of those periods where decades appear to be happening in weeks. That's when you really need to come together and partner up, especially now if we're going to achieve this $18 billion seventh replenishment goal. Next, I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Crystal Burunji. Ahu! I can see she clearly has a lot of support and fans in the room, and why not? There she is sitting there looking resplendent. Is that in Ugandan uh, attire? Whoa, okay, the Ugandans are here in force. The Bianyinimas and the Burundis are here. Well, starting off on a serious note, Crystal experienced the horrors of malaria as a child, but look how she bounced back. She's now an entomologist working to develop new genetic technology to reduce transmission of the disease. Now, before Crystal joins us, please turn your attention to the screen. My little brother was five and uh, he was convulsing. My mother used to work, but she had to make a decision. Should I stay at home and, you know, keep this child cool so that they don't die or do I go out and make the money that I need to buy the medication? My name is Crystal Birunji, and I am fighting to end malaria in Uganda. I am an entomologist. Studying mosquitoes is very important. Most of my work is in a project called Target Malaria to reduce uh, mosquito populations, thereby interrupting malaria transmission. What it means when you save the life of a young child is that you save the future of a nation. I fight for what counts because every child, regardless of where they come from, should be protected from malaria. My name is Krista Birunji, and I am a malaria survivor from Uganda. Where I come from, over 90% of the population is at risk of malaria, and yet very few people can afford to treat it. That was the situation that my family was in when I was growing up. 
One of the memories that has stayed with me and shaped my life is that of my mother sponging my five-year-old brother all night. He was convulsing because he had malaria. I knew there was a treatment for the disease that he had, but we just didn't have the money for it. I recall the first time that I myself had malaria, or at least my first memory of having malaria. I remember feeling so weak that I could barely lift my head, even for a drink of water, despite a feeling of burning thirst. I remember being unable to eat because I would immediately vomit until the very thought of food made me want to cry. I was five years old. Imagine for one moment that one in every 20 children that you know will die before they turn five years old. And now imagine that that could be your child and there is nothing that you can do to save their life. That is the reality where I live. Malaria is deadly. There is an intense feeling of helplessness and despair that comes over you when you watch someone that you love fight a deadly illness and there is nothing that you can do to help. I cannot describe what it is like to watch someone die of an illness that is curable and understand that it could take your own life. It's a pervasive feeling of terror that you eventually learn to live with. Malaria almost killed both my brothers and myself multiple times, and yet we were the lucky ones because we survived. I also remember what it was like when the Global Fund came to Uganda. They brought free treatment to hospitals. They funded free malaria mosquito nets and the village health teams. These were people in the community that were trained to diagnose and treat malaria for free. Finally, being poor and having malaria didn't mean that you had to die. When I was growing up, nearly one in every three children didn't live to the age of five, many of those because of malaria. Today, that number is one in every 20. The impact is undeniable. Seeing the difference that the Global Fund made inspired me to do something about these mosquitoes that spread malaria. And so I became an entomologist. And today I work with Target Malaria, an international consortium that is developing gene drive technology to reduce mosquito populations, thereby reducing malaria. I am trying to save lives. The Global Fund doesn't simply save lives, as amazing as that is. It saves the future of our countries. Malaria takes away a community's ability to lift itself out of poverty, to build itself a better future. I am alive today because of the Global Fund. Thanks to the Global Fund, I was able to get an education because my mother didn't have to choose between paying for school or trying to buy treatment for malaria for me. Thanks to the Global Fund, when I got older, I was in school studying, instead of at home looking after a sick sibling, as is too often the responsibility of girls in families. Now I can afford to pay for treatment for my own son, for other family members. My family is no longer in the situation that we were in when I was a child. Every child everywhere deserves to be protected from malaria. Every mother deserves to be free of the fear that her child would die from malaria. I am living proof that the Global Fund works, that every dollar invested isn't just saving lives, but building a better future. I am just one voice, but imagine how many doctors, teachers, lawyers, artists we would have lost if the Global Fund had not saved their lives too. I am one voice of 50 million saved over the last 20 years. The Global Fund needs at least $18 billion to save 20 million more lives. People just like me. We cannot stop now. We can eliminate malaria, but only if we join together and fight for what counts, for every single life, for every mother, for every child, for all of those 
who cannot fight for themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Burunji, for sharing your personal story and for the immense contribution uh, you make both as a scientist and as an advocate in the fight to end malaria. I mean, in my day job, I'm a radio and television news broadcaster. And uh, only a few weeks ago, I remember reporting on a breakthrough that people were hailing from the WHO and elsewhere in medication, in technology, that could give us a shot that will help drive out malaria for good. We're getting closer and closer. But to build a better future, we must seek inspiration from lessons of the past. Uh, today's first panel will discuss how lessons learned from the Global Fund's 20-year history can be used to maximize future investments to end AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria and build stronger health systems. The stronger health systems are key to prepare for future pandemics. And to put this discussion into context, I'm very pleased indeed to welcome to the stage Ambassador John Nkenkasong, the US Global AIDS Coordinator and Special Representative for Health Diplomacy. Ambassador Nkenkasong. How are you? Good. How are you? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, this is, it's difficult to follow Crystal. This is a, uh, where is our director of program? I mean, you should have probably placed me after Winnie or, or, or something. <laughs> Great. Really a pleasure to, to join this uh, very important occasion. Let me start by truly recognizing and congratulating the Global Fund partners for the tremendous work you have been doing, mobilizing the whole world. Peter, I don't know how many trips you've made across the world. When I just took over the leadership of, of uh, Pepford, uh, you visited me, and the following week, I heard you were somewhere in Indonesia, then the following week, we were in Geneva. So I don't know how many of such trips you have made, but again, those um, efforts are being rewarded and will be rewarded um, uh, this week. The replenishment of the Global Fund the seventh replenishment, as most people have said, and the secretary was here, just left, talked about a moment, and Donna talked about a movement. I believe when I reflect on this, it tells me of what Dr. King reminded of, us of, of being at the mountaintop and seeing the promised land. For the HIV AIDS fights, I believe we've come to a moment where we are seeing 2030 and that is our promised land. And if we do it right and get the global fund replenished and continue to show political leadership, political commitment, political commitment, we will get there to the promised land. I'm very convinced. I couldn't have imagined, I've spent 30 years in HIV AIDS, started working in HIV AIDS in 1988, I couldn't have imagined that someday, as Donna said, there was several years of, or decades, lost decades, that we will be able to project our minds and see a promised land in 2030, where we're saying, if we just do it right, we are going to get to the promised land. I was very pleased when, at the start of this ceremony, a, a video was projected and Kofi Annan's voice was projected. I was so delighted and touched. He said something. He said, hurt is a human right. It should not be something that we go to but praying for and wishing for good hurt. It should be something that we fight for to get good hurt. And the Global Fund and Pepford are examples of when humanity applies its mind right to solve a social problem, it takes us to that promised land. From PEPFAR's perspective, we will continue to work very closely with the Global Fund. We will continue to work with countries to equalize and 
begin to minimize the gaps in inequity. I've always said that the Global Fund and PEPFA represents the best equalizers of inequality and inequities with respect to the fight against HIV, AIDS, malaria, and TB for, for the Global Fund. Krista talked about her personal experience. Let me share my personal experience. Growing up in my country of birth, Cameroon, at a young age, I thought I was always going to die because of malaria. Because you go through episode after episode of malaria. There was no global phone at that time. Peter, I wish we had global phone when I was growing up. And many of my playmates died of malaria. So it's real what the global phone, the power of what the global phone has done to change that dynamics, to change that narrative for countries that are affected is so powerful. We at the PEPFA will continue to work with countries, leverage on the tremendous assets, the tremendous public health assets that Global Fund and PEPFA have established in countries, leverage that to fight other disruptive pandemics. There are silent pandemics like HIV AIDS, let no one be deceived. HIV AIDS continue to be a serious health security threat, a serious economic threat. It's not as disruptive as COVID, but if we leverage the systems, the public health systems that we've put in place to fight HIV AIDS over the last close to 20 years, both from the PEPFA contributions and Global Fund, I'm very convinced that the next outbreak, the next pandemic, which we all know is a question of time, not if it will occur, we'll be better positioned to, to fight it. So we are truly honored and humbled to be working side by side with the Global Fund especially during this replenishment. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you very much. And it's really important your focus on um, equalizing the situation. I mean, we talk about leveling up these days, building back better. Well, we've got to level up in health as well, because when I go to Ghana, I'm always armed with malarone, you know, those tablets, or larium for protection. I'm sitting there opposite my relatives, having my, my Ghanaian club beer or star beer, but I've got protection, and they're sitting there. And then one of my relatives said, can you give me one of your tablets? I said, oh, no, no, I need protection. He said, what about me? I didn't know where to look. So you can see, we have to equalize things, and the Global Fund is a very, very important instrument in that equalization. All right, it's time for our first panel. Are you ready for the first panel? Yeah. Of course you are. Of course you are. Well. To introduce our panelists, please welcome our moderator. She is a physician who hails from Benin. She's a global health specialist and she's an excellent moderator. Please welcome Dr. Joanne Bewa. What a fantastic moderator you are, Eric Bonsu. We actually practice, if I should say, Henry Bonzu, like the British accent, or use my American accent and say Henri Bonzu, or my French accent and say Henri Bonzu. Well, I hope I do both, actually. Excellencies, distinguished guests, mesdames et messieurs, good afternoon, bienvenue. I'm Dr. Joanne Bewa, I'm a physician and global health specialist, and I am delighted to be part of this really important, critical, and timely panel on keeping our promise of ending AIDS, TB, and malaria. 20 years ago, when the Global Fund was created, its goal to end TB, HIV, and malaria seems to be like an impossible task, like a challenge. But the world came together. You came together, each of you here came together, and I think you all deserve an applause before we continue. In fact, tremendous progress has been achieved, but the fight is not over. As one of the speakers was saying, the current COVID-19 pandemic has affected, has impacted, and has revered some of the gain, especially progress made over the last two decades. Today, to discuss how we can get back on track and keep the promise on ending HIV, TB, and malaria, I will be joined by a distinguished panel of experts. Please help me welcome Dr. Leonid Leka, 
Executive Director of Partners in Health Peru, and lecturer at the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Please. I will invite His Excellency Mr. Budi Gunadi Sadikin, Minister of Health for the Government of Indonesia. <laughs> My pleasure to invite on stage Ms. Jennifer Lotito, President and Chief Operating Officer of Project Red. <laughs> and the last but not the least, Ms. Suzanne Mochache, Principal Health Secretary at the Ministry of Health of Kenya. A very warm welcome to you all. So my first question will go over to you, Ms. Mochache. Uh, as you know, and as the audience certainly know, Kenyan has been one of the key, you know, global fund implementing partner in Africa and has achieved such a significant impact in terms of eradicating, tackling, and fighting against the three diseases over the past 20 years. What has driven this success, if you can share with us? Uh, thank you very much. Um, first, just to appreciate uh, the minds and the people who are behind starting the Global Fund. 20 years ago. Um, we have been driven by a situation that I would like to take a moment for us to pause and reflect 20 years ago when in Kenya and of course in the world we saw a lot of people dying because of HIV and AIDS. When for the first time we began to experience child-headed households because of children who were left orphaned as their parents died because of HIV. When we had elderly persons having to deal with raising their children's children, that's their grandparents, and the social and economic burden that came with that. In fact, it is at that time when we started talking about social protection programs. How do we take care of these households? And really, what has helped us make the gains because we have made a lot of gains. When people had no hope, there was only despair and stigma related to HIV and AIDS. We have, through our own funding and that support of the Global Fund, which is significant, seen the reduction of HIV and AIDS, the deaths by almost 67%. The malaria prevalence has gone down to almost 8%. TB is no longer a worry of uh, fear and death because at least 85% of the people we find with TB are treated. And so really I will say that the success is about collaboration. It's about the partnership between the governments, between the communities, between the different stakeholders that have come together to put an end to HIV, TB and malaria. And that is what I would say has fundamentally driven us in the fight against the three diseases and the successes that we have achieved so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Muchache, for sharing those valuable insights. You really focused on the fact that you and your government acknowledge that social protection is key and health is a basic human right. But you also did believe and still do believe in the power of partnership and collaboration, and we do thank you for that. Now I will turn to Minister Sadikin. Uh, Indonesia uh, has been and continued to be one of key global fund implementing partners in Asia. And your country has achieved significant progress from strengthening health system to tackling infectious diseases and, and more. Can you share with us some of the drivers of this success? First, I have to thank Global Fund because for 19 years have been helping Indonesia more than 1.4 billion. I just realized because I just moved from financial sector for 30 years and moved to health sector for one year and nine months. So very, very short compared with the Global Fund supporting Indonesia. And in 2003, 
Global Fund support in Indonesia for the first time. In 2004, there was a major political changes in Indonesia where we become a very decentralized nation politically. Where before, everything about health is very centralized. Now it's become very centralized. So 270 million people, 17,000 islands, 414 cities, 34 provinces become very decentralized. Now it really depends on the mayors and the governors to manage the health systems. It's extremely difficult. So having an external private sector support in terms of funding, in terms of governance, really helps if I look backward. So when I see now, digitalizations, external funding, standardizing the programs really helps us. Standardizing the programs from these centers, coordinating the fundings, both by the central governments and also the private sectors, and digitalization the system so make it transparent, helps how the central government can work together with the local government, 414 of them, because all of them are had by a different mayor for different political parties, so we can coordinate this health system together. And having external private sector like Global Fund really, really helps. Moving forward, we would like to make sure that the existing primary healthcare systems that we have, 10,000 of primary healthcare systems that have 300,000 community health workers that each of them had eight people working of them, consists of 1.8 million community health workers, can be used. That before is very centralized, become very decentralized, that can be utilized as efficient as before. So again, thank you Global Fund since 2003 helping supporting Indonesia. You have a very committed partner. Thank you, Minister Sadiken. And those are really important lessons to learn as you have focused on the importance of decentralizing health systems, restructuring health systems, but also partnering with external partners, including private sector, in terms of strengthening governance, but also supporting in financing. And I think these are lessons that I was saying are really important to notice. And since you have made a clear transition uh, and facilitate my work, I'm going to the private sector now. Uh, I want to hear from Ms. Lotito. RED has been a global fund partner since 2006 and uh, a significant donor, a significant contributor with about 700 million invested so far. That is huge. And so I'm sure myself and the audience over here is really interested to know what has driven this long term commitment to the Global Fund, and, and how does RED contribute to the Global Fund's vision? Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, and as a New Yorker, I just welcome all of you to New York City. And apologize in advance, so it's going to be an awful traffic week, as we all New Yorkers know. So please don't hold it against us. But I am here as a New Yorker um, and on behalf of RED, which are 25 people. Um, our office is about two blocks from here, actually. And as you mentioned, we have generated over $700 million for the Global Fund. And the way we do that goes back to the reason why RED was created in the first place, which is to bring the private sector into the fight. Um, you know, we, we have one mandate that is two-pronged. Uh, we're all about getting the cash, getting the money, um, so that Peter can do the work, Peter and his team can do the work that they all do so well. But what's really, really important, and I think everybody here can attest to, is to create the heat, to get people out there to care. We've seen this with HIV AIDS. We are so close to ending this, but we have got to get people to care, and we've got to get them to recognize that this is not over. The same goes for COVID. Same thing's gonna happen with the next pandemic. 
So what do we do about it? We bring companies into the fight. So hopefully all of you have gone into an Apple store and I hope you have bought the red iPhone instead of the black one or any other color they come up with because when you do, thank you, um, a piece of that price comes out of Apple's pocket and goes into the Global Fund's pocket, 100% of which goes to work on the ground. So that phone does not operate any differently, it doesn't cost any differently, but when you make that choice for a red product, whether it's at Apple or elsewhere, you are helping to save lives. So what we are really interested in is, um, you know, we're so proud of our partnership with Apple, but we need more of the private sector to come in and join us. We, when Red was started back in 2006, we were all about being all over the shopping malls, whether it was an Apple store or a Gap store or others. In 2022, we've got to be in places like the metaverse. We've got to be, you know, going into gaming. We've got to find new ways of engaging. We now have red cars, so you could have a red electric Fiat, a Cinquecento if you live in Europe. You can have a red Jeep or a red Ram truck through our partnership with Stellantis. Um, but red is actually more than just products. We are about partnerships. We also are very focused on new ways to engage the private sector. Um, we've been working with the life sciences industry. I am so proud of our partnership with companies like Merck, who invest in RED so that we can do more for the Global Fund. Companies like Roche, who we had never worked with before. Um, these are companies that are stepping up and helping us to navigate where others who care so deeply about the Global Fund can also play their part. And I just want to say one other thing, which is, you know, when RED was started, it was all about the HIV fight, the AIDS fight. It continues to be about that. But it also continues to be about a theme that many have mentioned here today, which is about the injustice that is making all of these things continue to thrive. These pandemics are thriving in marginalized communities, and, and that is just wrong. And so that's what RED is here, to tell the world, engage the world, and get them to invest in RED and invest in um, saving lives but also investing in the Global Fund. So hopefully everybody here is going to be part of that as we continue through the Replenishment Conference. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Lotito. And I think, thank you for sharing your know-how on how you can bring, and you were successful in bringing private sector on board, but also they know how to get the cash. And we have been hearing we need to get the cash to make the work move forward. And we do appreciate that. So now I want to turn to Dr. Leka uh, from Partners in Health Peru. Your organization is fighting various diseases and is making sure that people in the most remote and vulnerable communities in Peru have access to health care. Can you please tell us a little bit about your work in partnership with the Global Fund and what would you want to highlight as a key success? Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, PIS Peru, Socios en Salud, have been working for 26 years in, in Peru. Uh, and we began our work in the 90s and we implement the first community-based model program for MDR tuberculosis in, in the world. Uh, we, con we continue our collaboration and the, with the Global Fund support, we had the, the opportunity to to help the, the government to increase the, the capacity, the, the health system, and to expand the treatment for MDR tuberculosis in all the countries. We have a good re results. Obviously, we have some challenges, but I would like to highlight the, the current uh, curation rate for XDR tuberculosis. You, you know, the XDR tuberculosis is the most difficult time of tuberculosis. The current curation rate for XDR is 85 percent. This is a good result. This is a good partner good, uh, with the support with the Global Fund. Uh, I would like to mention the, the key pillar for these su success partnerships is two. Uh, the first is uh, we have the, the possibility to create more capacity building to the health system, the, to create the strong and resilient health system in different levels, in the national, in the primary care level as well. And the second and important uh, pillar is the community engagement. We have the work with the same community 
and this, this community helped us to reach the most poor, the most vulnerable, the forgotten communities. No? Uh, another example for our collaboration with the, with the Global Fund is that in the last three, three years, we are implementing the tuberculosis regional project. The focus is uh, strengthening the civil society organization. We are working, we create uh, TV social observatories in eight countries in Latin America and, and, the, and the Caribbean. Uh, they, at the moment, we have around 160 civil society organizations working together and hand to hand with the national tuberculosis programs in different activities like social vigilance, uh, advocacy uh, incidents, or uh, accountability. This is a good example that we are work together and we are interested to uh, continue this work and expand this initiative. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Leja. And I think you highlighted very critical points, including the role of community engagement in tackling the three diseases, the role of uh, engaging countries from a regional perspective and sharing lessons through a part part partnership. But also you've mentioned accountability, which is really critical. How do we keep each other accountable? How do we keep other people accountable? Those are well received and absolutely well noted. And I'm sure you have heard throughout this first round that some of the key successes of drivers to fight the three diseases include local and national ownership, strengthening health systems, restructuring health systems, partnering with external partners, including private sectors, but also keeping each other accountable. For this second round, I will come back again to a few speakers, uh, Mrs. Mochache, Ms. Minister Sadiken, and Dr. Leka. You certainly know, and I'm sure the audience also know, that many countries uh, which are part of the Global Fund Partnership have learned from decades of experiences in tackling the three diseases. And these countries were very quick and proactive in responding to the current COVID-19 pandemic, either using the same systems or the same supply chains or the same know-how. Could you please share, starting with you, Mrs. Muchache, some of the examples on how capacity built in response to HIV, TB, and malaria were critical when responding to the current pandemic? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think really COVID showed us the importance of Global Fund and the role that it has played in building our health systems. Um, in Kenya, we were able to respond quite effectively because of the investments that have been made through the Global Fund. One, we had the diagnostic capabilities we basically quickly converted our laboratory infrastructure for TB, HIV, and malaria for the purposes of COVID. And the fact that we had a good spread across the country helped us to also quickly, uh, you know, understand or avail the testing services across the country. I cannot emphasize more the fact that investments have been made significantly through the Global Fund on community programs. The community uh, system that has been built over the years through the Global Fund became a very key pillar in our fight against COVID-19. I remember in dealing with the very high concentrated populations in informal settlements, it was those community-based organizations affiliated and have, that have grown through the Global Fund that we were able to reach those people. We used the community network, one, to provide the basics, food, because you remember when we had the lockdowns, people basically could not access some of the very basic services. They could not go to work, especially those that are quite vulnerable. Availing PPEs, we use the community networks to avail the masks, to unveil the sanitizers. We use them to sensitize the communities. And those were the areas where we were most at, at risk of losing very many people to COVID. But because of those community networks, 
that have been established through the Global Fund, we were able to be very effective in terms of our outreach programs. We generally used our other health uh, infrastructure that has been built by the Global Fund, uh, particularly capacity building also for our health workers to respond to COVID-19. And on this particular point, I want to appreciate the flexibility that came in through the Global Fund that gave dedicated financing that simply scaled up on what had already been done and if you like, had an RRI approach to our COVID-19 response. So we were not starting from zero. We simply built on, on what already existed. So I cannot say enough that we were able to save the millions of lives because of the investments that have been made over the years in our diagnostic capabilities, in the community health systems. And we do appreciate the difference that it made during COVID-19. Absolutely, and this was straight to point, and I will bring in Minister Sadikin for a specific example on how experiences learned, the same question, experiences learned from the fight against the three disease were used for the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. So Global Fund helped us develop the labs for tuberculosis. So when I joined as health ministers by the end of 2020, December, we don't know anything about the variant of the virus. And I just realized that in the last nine months, we only did genome sequence for 340 genome sequence tests for the last nine months. And we just realized because we only have eight labs and 10 machines. And then after that, we coordinate all of them and we realized we only have capacity 1,000 per month. So we start doing it. June 2021, I met my fellow bankers in G20 meeting in Italy. And he said, Budi, because we are ex-bankers, I have extra money that I can you know, donate to you. Why don't you buy a ventilator or whatever as long as it is used related with COVID? And I said, I need a genome sequence machine. And he said, oh, you can use it also. And June this year, I increased my genome sequence from 10 to 30. And by December, I will have 40. So I increased by four times from 1,000 per month to 4,000. It's actually, it can reach 5,000 per month genome sequence. And I just realized it's not only be able to analyze, you know, variants of the virus, it can also be used for population genomics, for precision medicine, can be used also to analyze cancer, you know, tuberculosis, and many other things. And I distribute to all universities to do basic research on biotechnology. So it started again with, with, with uh, grant for, uh, from, from Global Fund. So it's amazing. Now I have uh, 20 provinces have the capacity to do biotechnological research using genome sequencing machines based from grant of Global Fund. It helped Indonesia to leapfrog the biotechnology capacity because we are a very rich in terms of genomic variety. So that is an example of Global Fund help us for funding the labs for COVID, but suddenly it put a very basic infrastructure for future research in future pandemics. So again, amazing. So thanks a lot, Global Fund. I just realized that, you know, you know in great opportunity, comes from great crisis and lofty, uh, great earthquakes uh, create lofty mountains. So again, thanks a lot, Global Funds. Thanks, Peter. And this is such an excellent, uh, such an excellent success story in terms of building capacity and continuing to expand capacities nationally. Uh, Dr. Lika, over to you to actually share a little bit about how capacity built in the fights of the three diseases were crucial for COVID-19. Uh, response. 
Yeah, when, when the pandemic started, uh, we have many, many challenges, many problems, but I, I remember that we quickly re reactivate our community health worker network. Uh, this community helped us to reach people with many problems, with, with many challenges. Uh, we change many of our programs. Uh, for example, we, in Peru, we have a famous program, TV Mobile, Mobile TV program, uh, that we add the COVID-19 test that to integrate the, the detection of the body disease. Uh, plus, we, we're, we're, we're using X-ray mobile units, uh, plus uh, artificial intelligence, uh, plus uh, community engagement, uh, again, uh, plus different activities uh, that include uh, psychomotional and socioeconomic support for vulnerable people. Yeah. We can to integrate these activities to reach more vulnerable people. With the Global Fund support, specifically with the C19 RM mechanism, we have the opportunity to extend this initiative. We implement a X-ray backpack. And at the moment, we are running in 12 regions in all the country to, with the goal is to reduce the detection gap uh, for tuberculosis uh, due to the COVID pandemic. The, the Global Fund support as well with the, another activities like improve the oxygen ecosystem, more, more, more molecular labs, and the, another uh, activities. At the moment, probably we are better uh, before the, the, the pandemic. Uh, we hope to resist another future problems, health problems. And I think those are really critical perspectives from Peru, and we, we, we had the opportunity to hear experiences on that topic from other different regions from the world. Uh, over to you again, uh, Mrs. Lotito. As you know, in November 2021, the Global Fund has adopted an ambitious new strategy. And this strategy focused on leveraging innovation, addressing structural barriers, and centering the work around equity, sustainability, and lasting impact. Critical to mention and remember that this strategy also put people and community at the center of the Global Fund's work. What do you think of this strategy and uh, how will the partnership between the Global Fund and RED evolve in the light of this new strategic direction? Thank you. So I think there's, there's two different areas here. So one is the work on the ground, which we're so proud to partner with the Global Fund and all of the work that they do there. Um, and then on top of that, there's everything we do to the private sector, with the private sector and bringing them in to make that happen. Um, but one, one thing that I think about often is the thing that's so incredible about the Global Fund has been that people-centric approach. Uh -huh. um, we've got a few people here, Connie Mudenda and Steve Latsike here, who are um, the people, the, the real people who are on the ground making this happen. And I think from Red's perspective, that is all about the people approach. And so, you know, we have seen firsthand, as you were mentioning as well, um, the lessons that we've learned from HIV. So whether you're at CHAZ in Zambia and you've been doing HIV testing and diagnosis, you know, the ability to be resilient and pivot and flexible and then start going and looking at COVID results and being able to quickly step up into that mentorship with others that is what's at the heart of the Global Fund. And while I sit here in New York City and, and bring all the private sector in, I do so knowing that their money is going to be so well spent because of that people-centric approach. Those are the people that are making this happen, and I get the honor and privilege to work with all of them and make sure um, that our partners hear those stories. So whether that's people like Merck that is, that is helping us and they're out there on the front lines, um, or others, you know, some are more directly involved and some are, are less directly involved, but it's the people on the ground that are doing that that is at the magic and at the core of what the Global Fund does. And I know that when I have to go into a boardroom to talk to a CEO of a, a big company, I am doing it knowing that those are the people doing the real work. And that is what really counts, and I will take advantage of the last 30 seconds remaining to wrap up this panel. 
and ask for one priority. It can be just one sentence or one word to each of you. One priority that is essential to ensure that the Global Fund keep its promise. Ms. Mochache, very briefly, one sentence or one word. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, the one um, priority that I think we, we, we now must carry on, and having learned from what COVID-19 has taught us, uh, the whole issue about uh, peer educators being utilized as part of um, you know, our response mechanisms. And I say this because in, in, Ken in Kenya, for example, in Africa, the demographics are very interesting. 60% of our populations are youthful people. These are, you know, the adolescent fall in that category. They account for almost 50%. And we are seeing more and more of an increase of uh, HIV amongst young people. So the interventions around peer education are so fundamental and so important. Because Absolutely. when you're talking about adolescents, really, you know, there's a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. And you need them to speak to their own on issues to do with testing, counseling, uh, gender-based violence. Absolutely. So, <laughs> and I could not agree more. There's so much to, there's to, so to much put an more. emphasis uh, on that as we move forward. There's so much more to learn from you, and we are so grateful for your contribution. Minister Sadiken, one word or one sentence, <laughs> please. I've, I've, I've raised hundreds of billions of U.S., but I, I feel I've contributed so small to humanity. So Global Fund, you will raise 18 billion of U.S., and I have a feeling that you, have, you will do so much for humanity. So thanks a lot, Global Fund. Thanks a lot, Peter, to create a healthy rule, not only for us, but also for our children and the children of our children. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Minister. Dr. Leka. I, I call on Global Fund and Global Fund donor to continue the collaboration with Latin America and, and the Caribbean country. Now is our, our responsibility to con continue the, the, the war and uh, avoid uh, suffering of millions of people. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Lotito, final word. Mine's really easy. So I have to imagine that all of you are here on an absolutely beautiful Sunday uh, in New York City because you care about the Global Fund. So if any of you are from the private sector, I would like to talk to you. So we would love to bring in every partner that we can. Um, I am shameless. We got to get the check, right, Peter? We are going to be making a pledge uh, in the next 48 hours. And I want everybody here that's in the private sector uh, to have a conversation with me. So we're not going to do this alone. And I'll just thank all of you who will help me get there. And it is on such a powerful call to collaboration and powerful uh, approach and invite that I would like to thank all the speakers for this contribution about how we can keep our promise as individual but as an organization. Please help me to thank them by your applause. All right, Viva Global Fund Viva! Viva Global Fund Viva. Viva! Now I would like to hand it back to the one and only Mr. Bonzo. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Biwa. And uh, silence, what's this silence for? Come on, you just enjoyed a fantastic, energetic, dynamic session. Thank you, Dr. Biwa and to all of our panelists uh, for that discussion. Um, it's really important to understand how the Global Fund interacts practically with organizations, because we hear about this $55 million, we hear about these targets, et cetera, but how exactly is the money used? How is it used when you work with the various different stakeholders, whether it's government, whether it's the private sector, whether it's advocacy? Now we've had a short illustration of how that is done. Okay. I would like to ask everyone to please turn your attention to the screen uh, behind me where we will meet Caroline Wasonga, a young woman from Western Kenya and a self-described, self-styled HIV warrior. Yes, woo! I remember my first time at the hospital 
no one could understand me, no one could talk to me. So I know if we talk to another HIV positive person, he or she will understand. My name is Carolina Chingwasonga and I'm an HIV warrior. I'm also a paralegal, I'm a community adolescent treatment supporter, I'm a mentor and I'm a facilitator. I am a mother to a negative baby. The bond that I have with my son is so special. He changed my life. He gave me a reason to start living afresh now. And I started adhering to medication. That was my turnaround point. Why am I helping the adolescents? Is because they don't get the counseling that they deserve. Are we adhering to our medications? Yeah. Do we check our drugs right on time? Yes. Stigma and discrimination. What did we say about that? You just think about your status, and that will make you to be stigmatized yourself. So there's self-stigmatization. And there's also stigma from other people. From other people. Yeah. This is a support group that share our ideas, share our thoughts. If your adolescent trusts you that much, that's where you'll find the GBV cases, and you'll have to follow them. We have a lawyer that follow these cases up to court and where they get justice. What I love about my job is that I'm able to change lives. You know, I can't change all of them, but there's a few individuals that I can change. My future, I believe it's, it's bright. I believe in fighting for what counts because you can make a difference in your society. That's what I'm passionate about. That applause is well deserved, is it not? Uh, well, Ms. Wasonga and her fellow peer educators illustrate the power of investing in community-led programs, not only to keep people healthy, but also to create more fair and equitable societies for us all to live in. That's what we want, don't we? Because societies where the gap between rich and poor is smaller, societies that care for people using central government taxation and, a, and, and an ethos of we care for everybody, we leave no one behind, they tend to be less violent and a happier societies. Okay, on to our next panel, because human rights and gender-related barriers to health, such as stigma, discrimination, and criminalization continue to fuel the spread of HIV, TB, and malaria. Addressing these challenges and ensuring the most vulnerable are not left behind is critical in the fight to end the three diseases. So, to discuss how we can achieve more equitable health outcomes for all. I'm joined, or I will shortly be joined, because they're not there yet, on stage by a distinguished group of panelists. First, I would like to welcome Lady Rosalind Murota, Vice Chair of the Global Fund Board and former First Lady of Papua New Guinea. Oi, okay. Next, we have Mr. Harold Phillips, who leads the White House Office of National AIDS Policy in the United States and brings over 20 years of experience in the HIV response. We also have Ms. Moon Ali from the Kawaja Sira Society, which is a community-based advocacy organization based in Pakistan that works to empower and protect the rights of transgender communities and ensure equitable access to healthcare. From the Government of Ireland, we have permanent representative of Ireland to the United Nations and other organizations in Geneva, Ambassador Michael Gaffey, whose career has included leadership positions at Irish Aid. And we have Mr. Antonio Zapula, Chief Executive of the Thomson Reuters Foundation. A warm welcome to you all. Come on. Thank you very much indeed. Everybody ready? This is going to be energized. It's going to be dynamic, it's going to be packed, and it's going to last just 31 minutes. 
We will see. So Lady Ross, we're going to start off with you. Um, let's think about the Global Fund's bold, ambitious, new strategy. I'm looking at Peter directly there. Uh, <laughs> fighting pandemics and building a healthier and more equitable world. I think we agree we want to do that, don't we? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the key objectives is maximizing health equity. People talk about equality, but equity, the distinction with the difference, gender equality, and human rights. Now, in your experience, how does this contribute to the goal of ending HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria? Thank you, Henry. Hi. As you said, our new strategy is bold and ambitious. It's also very focused. It's very clear that inequities are driving HIV, TB, and malaria. And ending those inequities will not just contribute to ending the diseases. They're actually critical. It's the only way we'll end the three diseases. Inequities disproportionately impact the poorest and the most vulnerable. They increase susceptibility to the three diseases, and they limit access to services. So tackling them is really important. All of our 20 years of experience have shown us that without tackling those inequities, the human rights barriers, the gender inequalities, we won't get anywhere. But we can do it. 20 years of experience has, has taught us that we can do it. Community systems are critical to reach the most marginalized. 20 years of experience has taught us that if we work together, we can beat these inequities and promote health equity for all. So the new strategy is a reaffirmation of all of that, but also there's a call to do more, to expand the use of data, to identify and respond to inequities, to strengthen community systems, responses and engagement, to meet the needs of key populations and vulnerable populations in policies and programming, to scale up programs to remove human rights and gender-related barriers, and to leverage the Global Fund's voice to challenge harmful laws, policies, and practices. Thank you very much, Lady Ros. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to turn to Mr. Phillips. Now, as director of the Office of National AIDS Policy at the White House, um, I want to do some sharing. I want to hear from you. Um, your personal experience regarding the importance of applying an equity lens or prism, whichever way you want to describe it, in AIDS policy making in the United States. Because we have the, the, the policy in macro, but then looking at it through the lens of equity, what does that actually mean? What difference does that make? All right. Thank you very much for the question, Henry. Uh, and good afternoon to everyone, and congratulations to our Global Fund partners. Um, as a black gay man living with HIV who works in the White House on national AIDS policy, it is an acknowledgement by both the Biden-Harris administration and also those of us in government that do this work, that recognize that historically we have created in the United States, just like in many other countries, structures and systems where access is limited by certain, to certain groups. And part of the work to address, look at this with an equity lens, is to try and improve access to services, to care and treatment and prevention, and even research. And thinking about it not only in terms of race, but also in gender in the United States. When we think about voting rights and reproductive health rights of women, so being in that role as a black gay man and coming with that lived experience, it informs and helps shape policy in the United States. We now have a new national HIV AIDS strategy, which is more inclusive and recognizes that historically racism has been a public health threat in the United States. And that calling upon all sectors of American society to work toward a more equitable and just and fair access to HIV prevention care and research services in the United States. I think our national prep program is an example of that right now black and Latino gay men, as well as black women in the United States, don't know that PrEP is available or for them. 
So we have a lot of things that we can learn equitably from our partners in other places in the world where black, black men, African women have access to PrEP and there are national PrEP programs. So Philip, thank you very much for being candid there and talking about the nexus between the personal, the political, the social, and I suppose uh, the agenda, how it can influence an agenda, especially when people have been marginalized for years. And talking of which, let's move to Ms. Ali, because your organization, the Kawaja Sira Society, you're advocating for and working with groups of very marginalized people in Pakistan. We're talking about the transgender community primarily. Uh, and looking at their access to um, justice and health care. So can you tell us more about your work and how you partner with the Global Fund? Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I really want to thank you, Global Fund, and uh, the people from uh, GFAN Asia Pacific um, who um, gave me space to sit here and to be heard and to listen to the voices of unheard heroes. So I really want to congratulate myself and the Global Fund too, to give the space to community. So let's speak about uh, what we are doing with the collaboration and with the partnership of the Global Fund. Khwaja Sira Society, founded in 2012, it's community-led and community-run organization. Khwaja Sira Society was developed under the regional grant that was the multi-country South Asia grant. And now Khwaja Sira Society is the part of national grant and part of the national HIV response. What we are doing, we are mainly focusing on awareness, behavioral change, communication counseling, prevention, HIV testing, STI diagnosis and treatment, and also with the collaboration of Global Fund, Global Fund has given us space to build a partnership not only with the Global Fund and with the national government. And through that, we are able to make alliances with key stakeholders and government. And through that, we are promoting the transgender rights and human rights in our country. By doing this, what we did so far, we have drafted the Transgender Protection Act, which is now law, and the transgender community have been recognized in our country as a legal individuals. <laughs> and also, we are doing advocacy with provincial governments, and now, the Local Government Act has been amended and the government is now ready to give seats in local government council to the transgender community. And government has formed and established the Transgender Rights Committee. The mainly focus of that committee is to end the inequality. And yes, of course, this would not be possible without the partnership of Global Fund. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miss Ali. Thank you very much indeed for bringing us uh, tales from the front line, what you're doing in, in Pakistan. It's amazing. You're making great progress. Uh, now, Ambassador Gaffey, let's talk about Ireland. I like uh, the title of your development aid policy, A Better World. It's what we're all driving toward, uh, and it fully embraces the Sustainable Development Goals framework, um, and of course, the goal of reducing inequality. And I, and I was uh, interested to know that Ireland makes its single largest uh, investment in global health through the Global Fund, which is quite something. Um, can you describe how investing in the Global Fund uh, reflects Ireland's commitment to the SDGs? Why would you choose the Global Fund as the vehicle? Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you to everyone for being here uh, this afternoon on this beautiful day. And, and just to say that I'm not an ambassador or anything anymore. I'm now back uh, Director General of our in International Development Programme, which probably will be of more use to the Global Fund. Um, oh, no, I, was, I, was, I, was being, I was giving you the honorific title of ambassador. In some, in some countries, even if you're ambassador 50, 50 years ago, you are still ambassador. Yeah, well, we don't believe in titles in Ireland. But very good, okay. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. But just, just to say, um, 
you know, Ireland is a small country, although it's maybe bigger in the sense of people in New York than it is in any other part of the world. <laughs> but Ireland is a very small country. But we have lived a development experience in our own lifetimes. I mean, for centuries, Ireland was known as a byword for famine and disease yep. and poverty. Yep. Now Ireland is known as a prosperous country because we engaged in the global economy and we engage globally. Therefore, we have an absolute obligation of global solidarity uh, to, to, to those less fortunate in the world. And that's what the SDGs are about. It's about common obligations, our common responsibilities. And I will say that uh, on, on Wednesday, when our minister speaks at the Global Fund, Ireland will meet its responsibility in terms of the replenishment. So, our, our latest policy, you always have to come up with names for development policies, and, and, and they're not always brilliant, but we can all agree that we want a better world. And we can all agree that after COVID and in the current situation of conflict, of food insecurity, that that's what we should be, we should be working for. Public health, the health, we have seen for years in Ireland, the links between health and poverty poverty and health. And we've seen it in our own country. In my parents' generation, TB was a huge scourge in Ireland, and there was a terror of TB. Um, so we see that still in other countries. Um, and the Global Fund has, for 20 years we've been involved in it. Our politicians became energized, and we had other major figures, such as Bono, who are huge champions of the Global Fund. So there is a real understanding in Ireland that the Global Fund can and does achieve results. And that's a crucial point. We're a member of the uh, board of the fund at the moment. And I just want to emphasize that point that the objectives for the next three years include that in really important objective of maximizing health equity, gender equality, and human rights. And that really is the basis on which we are so supportive of the fund today. Former Ambassador, thank you very much indeed. Now, <laughs> can't let you get away with that. Finally, to Mr. Zapula, good to see you here. Now, let's talk about the Thomson Reuters Foundation partnering with the Global Fund on the Breaking Down Barriers Initiative. We need to hear a bit uh, about this. So, can you explain uh, why Thomson Reuters Foundation got involved? Sure, thank you. It's, it's great to be here and to have the opportunity to, to talk about this project that we love because of the impact that's been achieving uh, since, uh, since, since the day when we launched in 2019 uh, in Lyon. Um, if you know Tom Sorotters, you know we're not in the business of healthcare. Um, so what am I doing here? Uh, we use media and legal interventions to shape fostering free, fair and informed societies. And this is because we believe that in order to have a long lasting impact, systemic change in creating free, fair, and informed societies. You have to have a legal framework that is just, and you have to have a media ecosystem that is free, fair, and unbiased. And so what are we doing with the Global Fund? We launched this partnership in, in 2019, and we are precisely using those media and legal interventions to remove those barriers that prevent access to healthcare because of bias, because of discrimination, because of an unfair legal system and because of, of violence. We are working in Africa right now, we're working in, uh, in, uh, in a number of countries in Africa and we are effectively doing a number of things. We are providing legal assistance to civil society organizations in the form of operational assistance so that they save those costs to actually reinvest the money into their programmatic work. We're also working with those civil society organizations to produce legal research that they can that can power their advocacy efforts significantly, and then we are uh, providing capacity building to media organisations and civil society organisations. So effectively, we are helping the media understand how to report healthcare issues fairly and accurately, and how to look at solutions that are being implemented by civil society organisations and that are actually producing results in removing precisely these barriers. And then we are also training civil society organizations in being able to tell the story better to the media and being able to better advocate for change when it comes to policy. We then bringing them together to create par partnership and, and foster synergies between civil society and the media. And the results have been fantastic. There is one quote that I actually want to read you because it's, I think it speaks to the impact of the work that we are doing. It's a quote from a journalist based in Africa who says, I'm now conscious of bias when editing articles. 
This bias has often to do with vulnerable populations such as women, children, members of the LGBT plus community, prisoners, sex workers, and this bias has increased particularly after the COVID-19 pandemic. This, partner this partnership has resulted in 24 articles being published in uh, Kenya, uh, Ghana, and Nigeria, just to mention a couple of, of countries. And these are powerful stories. These are stories about HIV discrimination. These are stories that explore the link between HIV and suicide. These are stories that look at the effect of COVID on accessing antiretroviral drugs. These are gutsy stories, and it's fantastic to be able to read them in the media. Mr. Zapula, thank you very much indeed. That concludes the first round of questions to our panel. We're going to pause for just a second because I'm delighted to say uh, we have a political champion of this agenda, a very powerful congresswoman from the west coast of the United States. She is US Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Now, let me tell you a bit about her. Chairwoman Lee is a fierce advocate for ending HIV AIDS. She has co-authored, uh, or authored indeed, every major piece of HIV AIDS legislation, including the legislative frameworks for PEPFAR and the Global Fund. Dame, I say Dame Barbara Lee. See, I've built you up to the, even to the level of Dame. You've been ambassador. I've now removed that title from you. I, Barbara Lee's not a Dame, but she's a powerful woman. Barbara Lee, Congresswoman Lee. First of all, good afternoon. good afternoon. And I heard part of the panel, and thank you so much for your leadership, for your wisdom, and for being here to continue this fight because we will see the end of AIDS by 2030. And I'm confident of that because of you and because of all of you. So it's really a, a remarkable moment uh, as it relates to the Global Fund because the hard work of the Global Fund over the last two decades how many lives have we saved? About 50 million lives. And so I'm hopeful that this week we will see governments deliver the support that the Global Fund needs to finish the job of defeating HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Now, uh, as mentioned, I serve on the Appropriations Committee, and I chair the committee that provides the U.S. support for the Global Fund. And I'm so proud that this year's House funding really does set the stage for a very robust commitment to this replenishment. Our bill included $6.39 billion for the Office of Global AIDS Coordinator, including $2 billion for the Global Fund, which is a down payment on our $6 billion. So, yeah, that's something to applaud. Finally, $6 billion. Thanks to all of you. And it's my hope that our final bill will have the, this funding level. You know the process we go through here, but I'm confident that we're going to be able to build upon the work of the last two decades and, yes, finally end AIDS by, AIDS by 2030. Effectively reaching key and vulnerable populations is absolutely essential if we are truly going to end AIDS by 2030. We know that people in these populations account for 65% of new HIV infections globally. Reaching the most vulnerable people is critical to controlling the ep uh, HIV epidemic, including in our own country as it relates to people of color in the United States. It's really a moral obligation, and so I'm proud of this movement and working with this movement to help build the Global Fund two decades ago. Equity has always been a central mission to the fund, and it's our duty to make sure that we get quality care to everyone who needs it. And I just very briefly worked for the, our beloved, the late Congressman Ron Delms. And when I was elected to Congress, we sat at his kitchen table and talked about an AIDS Marshall Plan for Africa. Well, what happened was that morphed into the global HIV AIDS 
Malaria and Tuberculosis Relief Act of 2001. Bill Clinton signed that into law, and that established the framework for the Global Fund. That was a major step by the United States of America. And so I'm so glad that the new UN, UN AIDS Global AIDS Strategy in March 2022 and the UN High Level Meeting on HIV in June 2021 focused on ending these inequalities within an emphasis on evidence-based actions to combat global HIV, which was our goal way back in the day. Moving forward, though, we need to find better ways to reach and to engage vulnerable people to identify where they are and get them the services and responses tailored to meet their needs everywhere, including, again, in our own country, in the United States of America. We must build the capacity of service delivery organizations led by key and vulnerable populations. We must strengthen our partnerships with civil society and community groups that focus on key and vulnerable populations, and we must obtain better data to guide our responses. Most importantly, we need to address the broader structural and legal environment, including reducing stigma and discrimination in public and private HIV settings, and further having a zero tolerance policy regarding the discrimination of staff and partners. This is where diplomacy and political leadership to get the policy changes needed will be absolutely crucial. Just want to uh, remind you of the HIV, we had a UN commission on HIV and the law. And we, our job was to travel around the world to look at laws that were discriminatory against those living with the virus. Well, the United States was not on the list of countries to visit. Uh, I guess everyone, and I was the only American on the commission. Well, I decided to ask the question about why aren't we doing any of these hearings in the United States? Finally, we said, okay, we'll have one. And we had it, of course, in my hometown of Oakland, California. Okay, and lo and behold, yeah, we did it in the East Bay. And lo and behold, the United States was also a bad actor. We have states in our country right now, the majority of states have these discriminatory laws on the books. And so California was one of the first states, finally, to take the law off the books, to repeal that legislation. But I have legislation now that would provide for a federal effort to help states to begin to repeal all of the HIV discrimination laws. Because we've got to do it here if we're going to tell the rest of the world. You know, and, and so we see key institutions, those taking steps in this direction, but we've got to do that. So any of you who have members of Congress and who are from the United States, tell your members of con Congress to support my legislation, the HIV AIDS uh, Discrimination Act to repeal the, those laws. PEPFAR, let's talk about that for just a few minutes. It has a key population investment fund that's designated to accelerate key populations access to prevention and treatment services with an emphasis on funding for indigenous community-based and led organizations. The Global Fund has a breaking down barriers initiative that scaled up evidence-based programming to reduce human rights related barriers to access in HIV, TB, and malaria services in 20 countries. UN AIDS which we fund through my, my bill and my committee, we support a people living with HIV stigma index. That is a standardized tool to gather evidence on how stigma and discrimination impacts the lives of people with HIV. In the United States, of course, we're working to require the federal government to review all existing federal and state laws, regulations, and judicial procedures and precedents that burden people living with HIV and put forth a strategy for their elimination. This is a human rights issue, and it's a civil rights issue, and it's a necessary step to end this epidemic so that we can make sure that there is HIV care and that it can reach everyone. And there's no question 
that advancing HIV prevention and treatment programs for key and vulnerable populations must be a higher priority. While there has been much success, the results still have not been fully equitable. Marginalized groups, including here in the United States and black and brown communities, too often slip through the cracks. And so we have to, uh, I think, look at the equity in, from an equity lens, broaden our perspective, and be committed even more so now to justice in our health care system and to equity in all of our HIV AIDS initiatives. So I'm hopeful that we are seeing a new focus on reaching vulnerable people. You know, uh, COVID pandemic in many respects has taken us off track and has been a critical, critical moment where in many respects we've backslid, backslidden. So we are gonna have to increase our efforts now to uh, catch up. But you know, we had the, and I just have to say, we had the infrastructure built through the HIV AIDS strategies so that the COVID vaccine could be fast tracked, excuse me, and so that the delivery systems were there to be able to deliver those drugs. And a lot of this came through the HIV AIDS research and uh, sort of the path, we were the path uh, layer for COVID in terms of how we were able to begin to address COVID. So we need to hurry up and get a vaccine for uh, HIV and AIDS. I mean, that's absolutely essential because we've done the groundwork now. We got the COVID vaccine. We certainly, it's long overdue for a vaccine. So thanks again for being here. Uh, and I'm glad to continue to be in this fight with you. Uh, but we've got to finish this job. And we've got to end HIV and AIDS and TB and malaria together. And uh, I want to just say to you that uh, this has been a mission of mine for most of my life. And so we are seeing progress, but we're seeing back some backsliding also. But I'm confident and I'm hopeful. As a black American woman, you, you have to be hopeful, you know. <laughs> you, you have to be hopeful <laughs> that we truly will see the end of age by 2030. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, we hope the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, That's right. as a great person once said. Thank you very much. Very positive air in the room as Congresswoman Lee uh, leaves uh, stage. Right, we're going to go into our second round. And, and I think uh, each of you channeled the positivity that uh, Congresswoman Lee has also reflected there. But at the same time, as she said, there are still some challenges, some difficulties, legislative difficulties, funding difficulties, stigma difficulties. Let's talk about those in the round two. We'll have to be a bit briefer because we're running slightly over time. Uh, let's try and discuss some of the challenges that you hinted at in the first round um, because we're trying to address some deep-rooted inequality. So, Ms. Ali, uh, from what you are doing in, in Pakistan, can we hear your thoughts first? What's the biggest challenge you're facing in your work and how can the international community of which we are a part help more effectively? Uh, there, are, there are a lot of challenges which we need to highlight, um, but uh, let's be specific as we are short of time. So uh, I'm going to address the challenge which is related to the national health response. So uh, still uh, the transgender community and the uh, broader LGBTI community is facing uh, the inequalities within, uh, within the existing health system. And this increased the barriers in accessing the HIV health services, uh, lack, of, lack, lack of sensitization of healthcare providers, including doctors and nurses. And this, uh, this also uh, leads to um, a lack of the integration um, uh, regarding the prevention of three diseases, the HIV, the tuberculosis, and the malaria. So, um, and the other uh, biggest challenge uh, which we are facing in our country is as per the um, UNAIDS uh, Global um, uh, Update 2022 uh, in danger, that reflects the key population uh, is, uh, has been impacted during the COVID-19 situation. And due to this reason, the HIV prevalence among key population has been increased. So this needs to be addressed. So uh, what international community can contribute it, uh, to it? So uh, as uh, I am sitting in um, the Fight for What Count campaigns, so um, I would suggest, so, uh, and I uh, really want to have a commitment uh, 
uh, from international communities, specifically related to the donors. Uh, like as across the Asia Pacific region, 94% of new HIV infection among key population, including sex workers, men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, and transgender people. Therefore, it is a critical that donors need to invest in the institution like Global Fund. Because Global Fund is the institution who, who have been committed to contribute, uh, to serve to the marginalized community and to protect them by imposing the prevention system in national health response. And other thing is that, most importantly, we really want to see sustained investment in key population and communities beyond service delivery, like for community system strengthening, because we really need the recognized and formal spaces for the communities. Thank you. Ms. Ali, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. A lot of support for your view here in, in the room. L Lady Ross, I'm just thinking about the challenges faced by women and girls in uh, Papua New Guinea. Can you reflect on some of those and what more needs to be done and how um, the muscle that's in this room that will be reflected even more deeply and more powerfully on Wednesday, how much more effectively can it help? Madasi Henry. Ah, whoa, I'm very impressed. Why are you? Which means, oh, you have done well, oh, you have done well, oh. That's what, that's what it means. One of the most significant barriers to HIV prevention for women in Papua New Guinea, and in fact for men who, sex, who have sex with men and transgender people, is the extremely high rate of gender based violence. I'm sorry to say that Papua New Guinea has the second largest rate of gender based violence of all countries in the world. 70% of women have reported rape or sexual violence in their lifetime. It's not surprising that the HIV epidemic is concentrated in vulnerable populations. While the incidence of HIV in the general population is less than 1%, it's 20% in sex workers and almost 9% in men who have sex with men and transgender people. So the good news is that there are lots of initiatives to try and combat this, including the Global Fund HIV Grant, where we're funding integrated GBF referral as part of the HIV prevention outreach and case management. We're working with the sex workers organization, Friends Fran Japani, on interventions to reduce gender-based violence among sex workers. And we're trying to ensure better services and better access to services by engaging key population outreach, work, outreach workers in GBV prevention, support, advocacy, and accompanying people to their referrals. That's tremendous. I know you've been doing partnering with Fondation Chanel as well, Bois Essentiel, and, um, strengthening engagement of women and girls in um, Senegal, Burkina Faso, and, and Côte d'Ivoire. Exactly. Tremendous. Excellent. Lady Rose, thank you very much indeed for, for that. Uh, uh, let's uh, go now to Mr. Gaffey, <laughs> Mr. Phillips, and Mr. Zerpula, Monsieur. Um, now, your co-panelists, uh, Ms. Ali and Lady Rose, spoke to the problem of discrimination and stigma, as well as the exclusion of women and, and girls from decision-making that has an impact on their health outcomes. We know this. Um, so what about parallels with um, your experiences? Um, how do you see your own position and your own organizations addressing these issues and also lessons that the Global Fund can benefit from? Mr. Gaffey, can we start with you? Sure, yeah. I think. Um what we're hearing today and what we all know is that inequalities are pernicious and they are deadly. They're not theoretical constructs. Um, and uh, we, the SDGs put inequality at their heart, but I think we need a stronger understanding of just how deadly inequalities are and why this is so relevant for the work of the, of the Global Fund. We, after, in Ireland, after a long period of uh, 
development and reflection and voting, I might say, uh, have now made gender equality the very heart of our uh, development uh, program. And that covers a multitude, including uh, mater maternal health, uh, reproductive services. But I just want to say one area which I think is so important today, and it's an area where there is being a rollback and challenge, and that is sexual and reproductive health and rights. I think that we need to, if we are to fulfill uh, our ambitions and our objectives here, we really need to renew the understanding of the importance of sexual and reproductive health and rights for development, for human rights, and for humanity. So I would say that really would be one of the main lessons. Yeah, I mean, it's a tremendous, um, you know, living in the UK, and Ireland is a close neighbour, to see what's happened on those fronts, even in the last 10 years, it's truly remarkable. I mean, there really are uh, weeks where decades happen, and I think we've seen that in, in, in the Republic of Ireland. Mr Phillips, what about your position from the experience um, at the level of national age policy making? So, so can I stop for a second? Um, the, the, I'm not sure if it's the acoustics, but the background noise level seems to be creeping up a little bit too loudly, and so it's difficult to concentrate up here. There'll be a break very soon, in about 20 minutes or so, so please, if you could hold back those conversations that are not to do with this, just a moment or two, just so we can make a little bit of progress, and then we can free you for 20 minutes very shortly. Okay, so Mr. Phillips. Sure, thank you. You know, being in these positions, uh, like mine, uh, in the White House, one of the things that I have brought is this understanding of the importance of having individuals from the community with lived experience who are part of the dialogue and who can help shape, that pol shape policy and programs both at the federal and the local level. And so when it comes to women and girls and being able to have them share their experiences so that it can help us with increase our understanding and our knowledge base, I think it's so important. Um, Secretary Becerra, who was here earlier, um, one of the, he gave a talk to some of the White House staff and talked about he and his role as sort of our Minister of Health and him being uh, a gentleman of Hispanic background and what that means. And, and one of the things that he said stuck with me is that when we are in these positions of power, we have a certain responsibility to open doors for others who are not there. Not only use our voice, but make sure that other voices are also heard and at the table. And I think that's an important part. And, and I'm, I'm, the former ambassador talked about reproductive rights. And, and I so want men to understand that what's happening now is a human rights issue and we all have to be involved. It's not just that we can sit back and watch what's happening. Mr. Phillips, you're absolutely right. I mean. There's a term I learned, paying it forward, is something that you say here in the US and we're hearing it more and more in other parts of the English-speaking world. I'm sure there's a um, version française for that and in another language as well, paying it forward. Okay, and, and Mr. Zapula, fi finally at this point, um, can you highlight what you're doing? Tell us a bit more maybe about the Breaking uh, Down Barriers initi Initiative and how um, you are facing up to the challenges that still remain because, as I said, it's positive and I'm feeling confident about the agenda going forward, but on the ground there are still long-term, deep-rooted, I suppose, stigmas and um, barriers that people will not give up easily. I mean, there's, there's an amount of work to be done that is, that is unbelievable. I mean, these are, these are no easy, quick fixes. You're not fixing a pipe here. You are making, you're really fixing something long-term. Uh, and it goes back to the principle that I was arguing earlier, I was discussing earlier, so free law and free media. You know, I, I'm an openly gay man, I live in the UK, and I have legal protections. I'm not going to be incarcerated because of who I am and who I love. I'm not going to be fired because of who I am and who I love. I'm not going to be denied access to medical care. And so I can walk into a health center with confidence that I know bias and defamation won't be able to be used against me because the law protects me. But there are 69 countries in the world where homosexuality is still decriminalized. In 11 countries in the world, it's still punishable by death. So people like me who live in those 69 countries cannot come out, cannot walk into a health center and for fear that they're going to be losing their job, for fear that they're going to be incarcerated. And they live in some countries where the media openly calls them pedophiles, yeah. brand them like devil worshippers. Yeah. 
And so this work is important and it's a long-term work that has to be done. So, you know, join us in this fight. It's a long-term battle here, but needs to be starting now. Tremendous, tremendous. Thank you very much indeed. Finally, um, final round of questions and brief answers. Um, one breakthrough or innovation, I know you, some of you don't like these questions, but you're going to have to bring all your experience and focus it down on one breakthrough, innovation or opportunity that could grow, contribute greatly toward addressing health inequalities. And Mr. Phillips, I'm going to start off with you. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you want me to kind of give you a bit more time? Because the reason, no, no, okay. Your thoughts? Well, I think one breakthrough is uh, um, right now in the United States at the national level, we have the political will and leadership that understands the importance of equity, health equity, and has included ec access to HIV prevention, care, and treatment as part of the health equity agenda. And so that makes my job a whole lot easier when I've got a president and a vice president who are saying this is important, and they're saying it to the American people. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Phillips. Final salvo from Mr. Zapula. Um, your final comment there. You know, one breakthrough innovation or opportunity that would really make a difference. I mean, it's, again, it's innovation in when it comes to, to, uh, to the legal system. Decriminalization is definitely on a, on a good positive trend. I know there's a lot of politicians here. Go back to your countries. Get rid of those disgusting laws, please. Thank you, Mr. Zapula. Yeah. Mr. Gaffey. Well, I'll be very brief. If you want to um, promote economic and social development, fight disease, promote human rights, empower women and girls in their communities yeah. and in their societies worldwide. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Lady Ross, over to you. Echoing all of the last three, but obviously only one thing that I can say is fully fund the Global Fund. We need at least $18 <laughs> billion. Dollars. Thank you very much. I think that's a very, very popular proposal. And then let's finish with Ms. Ali, uh, our final thought of this discussion. Your thoughts. Hey, I'm living in a country uh, where only transgender communities legally recognized, but the other marginalized communities still criminalized. So we need to focus on the policy reforms. We need to focus on the health system where all humans can get the services without any stigma and discrimination. For that purpose, I really want Global Fund to sustain the investment in the communities and need to focus to leave no one behind. And this is what Fight For counts for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. One more time for the panel. Mr. Gaffey, Mrs. Apula, Ms. Ali, Lady Rose. Mr. Phillips, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. You are now free to exit stage right. Friends, Romans, countrymen, bring me your ears. I come to Berry Caesar, not to praise him. I used to be an actor. Thank you. I love that line. I come to Berry Caesar, not to praise him. Right. It's just this hall. It makes you want to project. It's fantastic. The energy in the room is wonderful. And that leads me to our next speaker. I would like you to join me in welcoming him. He is Sir Christopher Hone, founder and chairperson of the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. What can I say about this foundation? Well, it's the world's largest philanthropic organization that focuses specifically on improving children's lives. So please welcome Sir Christopher Hone. Good afternoon. Such an honor to address you today. My daughter describes me as a loving father, but a ruthless businessman. Business success allowed me to endow a $5 billion charitable foundation, Children's Investment Foundation, which has given away more than $3 billion to children in serving children in poverty in Africa and India. SIF has invested 
as a partner with the Global Fund since 2015. Initially, with initiating and scaling up treatment for pediatric HIV AIDS so the children would be treated for the first time. Our experience with the Global Front Fund has shown us that the Global Fund has the platforms, the leadership, and the track record to reach at scale those most at risk to HIV AIDS, TB, and malaria. We fully believe in and trust the organization and its leadership under Peter Sands. Today, six million people are living with HIV, but don't know their status. This is around 15% of the total infected population. This directly leads to one and a half million new infections each year. It's vital that these people are tested and treated if we are to end transmission of HIV AIDS through prevention and not only treatment. SIF is partnering with the Global Fund today on HIV self-testing, both saliva and rapid blood tests, with a commitment of $25 million through a performance-related contract. Self-testing is a game-changing innovation to find and put on treatment all the positive people who are silently and unknowingly spreading the disease. It's a cheap, very cheap, costing two dollar, under $2 a test, and very cost-effective way of preventing new infections. Positivity rates are typically 1% to 2% in the population, leading to a cost per positive person found and put on treatment of as little as $100 to $200 per person, compared to thousands of, of, of dollars for lifetime treatment. So self-testing for HIV AIDS is a no-brainer. And it will be a key strategy for the Global Fund to reach its 2030 target of virtually eliminating new infections. However, self-testing alone will not end new infections. PrEP, which um, here's a sample of it, will be another vital part of the Global Fund strategy. In South Africa, over 500,000 people are now using PrEP. We need to make PrEP available to those 5 to 10% of adolescents at high risk and other high risk groups such as sex workers. I'm pleased to share with you today that SIF will commit 33 million dollars to the Global Fund. <laughs> to fund prep for those who need it the most in the poorest countries to end this shameful injustice where there are new infections every day of children and women selling themselves to survive. Let me now turn to the $18 billion replenishment target of the Global Fund. With full replenishment, the Global Fund will save an incredible 20 million lives between now and 2026 for under $1,000 per life saved. The work of the Global Fund is literally a matter of life or death for millions of the world's poorest people. It would undoubtedly be a moral and ethical failure of all donors if the Global Fund replenishment is not successful. I urge all the donors here to do understand what is at stake here and listen to their hearts and souls and not only their intellect and serve the poorest of humanity by committing the funds which are needed by the Global Fund in full. Thank you.
So, Christopher, thank you very much for putting it in such dramatic terms, a moral and ethical failure. And I'm really kind of holding on to that figure, that 1, 000, under $1,000 per life saved. Again, a return on investment. Okay, this now takes us to our intermission. Those of you who are cold and want to get something down your throat, it's your time. So, it's time for refreshments. Uh, please feel free to go up into the balcony area or the back there. We'll begin again in 20 minutes. So enjoy your break. Please come back. We will resume momentarily and we'll be, we'll be building up to our final rallying speeches, including from the executive director, Peter Sands, from the mayor himself, Eric Adams. They're going to be here and we're going to be sent away feeling energized and optimistic and we're going to build up toward Wednesday. So please enjoy your 20 minutes and then come back. See you very shortly. Thank you.
keep it wheeling. Say how you feel it. Like you got the whole behind ya. Break all the rules. Break all the rules. How do you choose? Choose you. Let's hear it for Tone Wall. Come on. I love the arrangement. I don't know who did the arrangement, but please, bravo. Bravo, bravo, bravo. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for resuming your seats. Hope you got a bit of refreshing food and drink, especially those blueberries. Blueberries are a superfood. Antioxidants should consume them every day with a bit of turmeric as well. It's good for the brain. Right. Let's get started. This is part two. And I'm delighted to introduce Ms. Merinda Sibayang. Let me tell you about her. Ah, some of you know her already. She personally triumphed over multi-drug resistant TB and now fights to protect the rights of people living with TB and HIV in Indonesia. Now, before Ms. Sibayang joins us, please turn your attention to the screens. Thank you. I'm the multidrug resistant TB survivor. It was hell, but at the end, it made me realize who I am. My name is Merinda Sebayang. I'm fighting to end TB in Indonesia. If somebody gives you support, you feel stronger, and I think that's what the community needs because children are the future of this country. 
to impact a lot of people, we need to change the policy, which will affect the whole community. I fight for what counts because being part of marginalized groups should not be a barrier to achieving your dreams. Hello. Good afternoon. While you were watching the one minute video, 20 people somewhere around the world fell ill to TB, a treatable and preventable disease that in many parts of the world, including my own country, Indonesia, equates to financial catastrophe and hardship. During that one minute, Three additional people also died of TB. Imagine that this could be your mother or father, your child, your friend or partner. And unfortunately, TB kills mainly the poor and marginalized. More than 10 million people fall ill with TB every year, and nearly 40% of those are missed, meaning they go untreated and unreported, and can continue to spread the disease to others. Drug-resistant TB makes up one-third of all global deaths from antimicrobial resistance, posing a potential catastrophic risk to global health security. Only 25% of those afflicted with multidrug-resistant TB are diagnosed and treated. I was one of the 10 million 16 years ago. My experience with MDR-TB meant almost daily injections to stay alive. And my treatment wasn't in a health facility near my home. It's 16 years ago. So I had to access it in other country. It's in Bangkok. I was very fortunate to be able to do that. Not many can spare the time nor the resources to travel. Although we have made progress, many people still face extreme difficulties accessing and affording treatment. People face serious adverse effects and catastrophic economic out-of-pocket costs. Progress made in TB has been hindered by COVID-19. Health systems have been disrupted. TB patients have faced obstacles in getting care, even in getting a diagnosis. Case notifications have declined, particularly in TB and MDR-TB high-burden countries such as India and Indonesia. Key populations and the vulnerable are most impacted by this disruption. HIV prevention efforts, such as prevention of mother-to-child transmission, have been heavily impacted. Just recently, I visited an orphanage where children as young as five years old tested positive for HIV after they found out they had intestinal TB, a chronic wasting disease. Those most often forgotten are the ones making on most of the burden. This is not normal. I repeat, this is not normal. This is what we want to end. This is what reaching at least 18 billion US dollars for the Global Fund, which provides 76% of all international financing for TB, will support to end, and this is the one critical opportunity to be able to end TB by 2030. And to do that, we, the community, must be involved more meaningfully and effectively we must be there at all stages, from planning to programming for TB. We know, we know what must be done to avoid more children suffering like that. I have three children, two still very young. And that is what the Global Fund has been doing through investment via the Stop TB Partnership Challenge Facility for Civil Society. 
it has been able to grow community collaboration through activists and advocates and sustain community leadership and involvement. The investment allow us to innovate, to go beyond business as usual, to achieve the end of tuberculosis. A target world leaders committed to at the UN high-level meeting on TB in 2018. The new Stop TB Partnership Global Plan to end TB 2021 up to 2030 estimate 250 billion US dollar is needed between 2023 up to 2030. And the seven replenishment seeks to raise at least 18 billion US dollar. But that is the floor, not the ceiling. If we are serious about attaining our set goals and targets, not reaching this target means that we will not be able to end TB as an epidemic. Well, it's been almost five minutes since I started talking. That means another hundred people failing ill to TB, possibly facing a crisis in their families, and another 15 people dying. That's 15 dreams, 15 loved ones, with even more people grieving from their loss. I don't imagine TB ending tomorrow or even next year, but I dream of an end to it and a world where everyone, including the most marginalized, can live free from the terror of TB. Your contribution is a matter of life or death for millions of us. Whether we can tackle these issues or if people will continue to die, we need your support together. We can work towards ending HIV, TB, and malaria, and really be serious about not leaving anyone behind because we are better together with the power of more. Coming together is the beginning. Keeping together is progress. But working together is success. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Once again, my name is Merinda Sbayang from Indonesia. I am a multi-drug resistant TB survivor and also HIV activist. Thank you. People, she deserves more love. Please, Merinda Sabayang. I've got to salute your strength and resilience. It's truly heroic, and you deserve all the plaudits you're getting right there, all the love you're getting there. You can feel it in the room. The room is a little bit cold because of the high ceilings and the way it is, but there's a lot of warmth for you and for all the speakers there, so thank you very much. The reason why your story is so important is it underscores that investments in innovation to accelerate progress, fighting the three diseases continues to be vital today. We're talking about innovation, innovative, flexible, and tailor-made approaches to fight infectious diseases that are particularly crucial in crisis situations like climate-related disasters and armed conflict. Now to our final panel. What will they be discussing? Well, they will discuss how best to protect health systems and reach the most vulnerable people who are caught in crises. And to provide a personal perspective to this important discussion, please welcome Ms. Valeria Raczynska. Now, who is Valeria Raczynska? Some of you know her already, but I want to do it now. I want to give her my word. Valeria is Human Rights, Gender and Community Development Director of the Ukraine-based civil society organization, 100% Life. Valeria, wow. Glory to Ukraine. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Valeria Rachinska, and I'm from Ukraine. I'm a woman happily living with HIV for 17 years and the mother of two healthy sons. 
My happy life with HIV I'm the is possible survivor. because I live at the time when IRT exists in the country where the global fund invests in the communities. It's a very strange feeling to know that someone is fighting for your life. And in this fight, the only acceptable result is a victory. The victory of life over death. To be clear, Global Fund has saved my life four times. The first time was in 2011, when I was able to first access antiretroviral treatment. My health was at critical low, yet treatment was not available for all in need. I was among the lucky ones. When I first received my treatment, I said thank you to all my doctors. But they said no. Thank you to the Global Fund. The second time the Global Fund saved my life was in 2014, when Russia invaded and occupied some parts of the Luhansk and Donetsk regions in eastern Ukraine. At the time, everyone with HIV living at the east was at risk of being cut off from their medications. But the Global Fund worked with us. My organization, 100% Life, to make sure we delivered in occupied territories, ensuring there were no major disruptions to treatment, including to mine. The delivery of IRT, condoms, syringes, and needles, and the continuation of prevention and treatment programs allowed us to achieve maximum success. We didn't have even a single day of interruption of services and treatment in conditions of active hostilities and occupation. In 2020, the Global Fund saved my life for the third time, as we faced the challenges of COVID, which left the entire country with only a one-month supply of HIV treatment. But the Global Fund stepped in, allowing for the redistribution of funds to provide an annual supply of life-saving treatment for every single person living with HIV in the country. Currently, I am the Director of Human Rights, Gender and Communities Development for 100% Life, the largest patient organization in Europe, working in eight countries with 16,000 members and one million beneficiaries. We are proof that investing in communities works. Through our work, we have achieved healthcare reform, empowered key populations, created for the government more efficient and transparent procurement systems, and advocated for human rights. These achievements are incredible, life-changing, but challenges continue to come. When the Russian invasion took place the past February, Ukrainian people were put at risk, all our people, but especially those who were already most vulnerable. People living with HIV, tuberculosis, people in prison, gay populations, especially women and girls. This was when, in 2022, when the first time the Global Fund saved my life. It's an indescribable feeling when you are sitting with your children in a bomb shelter with only one month of HIV medication left in your pocket. Scared, without understanding of the future. This was reality for me, my kids, and over 140,000 people living with HIV in Ukraine. But again, the Global Fund stood with us. As bomb fell and house rained, the Global Fund ensured, in a matter of weeks, that as a community, we were able to come together to quickly deliver anti-RT treatment and other medicines, open shelters, organize evacuations, and maintain our health programs. They were not stopped by bureaucracy, but quickly revised policies to ensure that community-led organizations were able to do what they need to, save lives. This shows that the Global Fund is not just a donor, but a partner. With the PEPFAR and the Global Fund support, we were able to reach communities even the hardest to reach areas. As the war by Russia continued to rage, 100% life and Ukrainian community-led organizations 
continue to save lives. Nothing can stop us from our mission to fight for life. And I ask you to help us all alive. I ask you to fight with us and with the Global Fund for the life of millions. And not just to fight, but to win that fight. Fight for our lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're right. You're okay. You're right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Larry Ratinska, for sharing your story. Very powerful. Imagine the difficulty, what people are going through right now. But it was really important that you talked about, not just about your own personal situation, but how the Global Fund has been able to adapt to the situation, not being blocked by bureaucracy, and has been agile, and not just a donor, but a partner. I took that from you, what you said, and I know Peter did as, as well. So fantastic. Um, now, on to our uh, final panel. And uh, just to prepare you for that, one of our panelists will be speaking en français. So please uh, use the translation headsets provided if you're not comfortable speaking or listening to French. And now to introduce our, our final panel, please welcome back to the stage our moderator, Dr. Joanne Bewa, please. Thank you, Mr. Bonzo, for this excellent facilitation, as always. And it is difficult to co come after such a moving testimony, but I want to say how grateful we are to everyone sharing their personal stories in this room. Distinguished guests, VIPs, participants, as we know, we are living, unfortunately, in a world with increasingly frequent crises such as infectious diseases, armed conflicts, and natural disasters. And it is critical today and tomorrow to prepare for, to respond to, and protect the progress achieved so far in the fight against HIV AIDS, TB, and malaria. As some of the speakers mentioned, and on a very personal note, we can all agree that virus outbreaks, crises, they have no borders. They absolutely have no borders. They have no citizenship. They have no nationalities. And personally, I had the opportunity to work on HIV across Africa and Benin Republic. And even since moving to the US a couple of years ago, as a researcher, I still follow very thoroughly progress made on HIV, TB, malaria, and more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sharing this just to say that none of us is protected against crisis or outbreak if all of us are not protected. So to discuss these very critical issues, I would like to invite a panel, distinguished speakers who will join me in a couple of minutes on the stage. Please help me welcome Mr. Sean Callahan, President and CEO of Catholic Relief Service. Mr. Callahan, I don't feel the energy in the room. I'm not sure why. I'm not feeling your energy. <laughs> I'm inviting His Excellency, Mr. Armindo Thiago, Minister of Health from the government of Mozambique. Next will be Dr. Barbara Koffler, Parliamentarian State Secretary for the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, Government of Germany. <laughs> Dr. Bintu Dembele, representing civil society, Chief Executive Officer, Arcade Santé Plus. And ACARD is a community-based organization providing medical and psychosocial care for people living with HIV in Mali. 
And last but not the least, Mr. Ashim Steiner, Administrator for the United Nations Development Program. A very, very warm welcome to you all, distinguished speakers. I can now feel the energy in the room, but I want to feel it more and better. Please, let's applause our speakers. <laughs> all right, all right. So I will start with Dr. Koffler, uh, drawing on your extensive and vast experience across many countries, including countries in crisis. Can you tell me a little bit how do you perceive uh, the evolution of public health and the fight against the three diseases in crisis settings? I hope that's on, yeah, that's working. Um, yeah, it was, I think the testimonies were showing a little bit how the situation at the moment is. We feel so many crises. It's about the situation of war where infrastructure gets uh, destroyed, which was just described also by the colleague from Ukraine. Uh, it's about um, climate catastrophe where people on the flight, we have more than 100 million people on the flight at the moment. Uh, all over the world, and the access to medicine, the access to treatment is reduced or is not there for those people. Though so those topics are very important for us, and we have to do more. And we have to invest, of course, in financing this treatment, but I think we also have to think about how does the treatment really reach the people? It's always the debate on the last mile. Uh, in some cases, we've seen that in COVID, in COVID crisis, you had the vaccine, you had the treatment, but you didn't reach the people. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to change our thinking from a disease-centered um, approach to a people-centered approach. And that's then including to come up with the idea how to really support basic um, health systems and basic uh, structures that people can afford the treatment and the, pe and the treatment is really reaching them. That's something which is very important for my government and what we really want to um, support in the future even more, to have a systematic approach to really reach the people. And then a uh, second important thing is, because I learned before about also the question of um, women and girls have a different need are in a different need. Um, sometimes they are not diagnosed uh, the same the men are, so there are a lot of challenges. Um, and what we also want to do and what we see in the crisis, there's a special need for supporting women and girls and supporting uh, them even more and sometimes also differently than the approaches for, for uh, men. And the last moment, uh, of course, we have to think if we think about COVID, that uh, diseases are spreading from various angles. So if you talk about zoonosis, if you talk about how um, pandemics are spreading from the animal, from the wildlife, from different natural environmental situations, we have to take that into consideration to really come up with more resilient systems and more resi resilient uh, approaches. Uh, because what we also learned from, uh, from COVID, how that really was also be challenging then for fighting uh, HIV, tuberculosis and malaria. And if another pandemic is coming again and hindering again, being more successful in f fighting those uh, diseases, um, I think we have to take that into consideration before. Indeed, Dr. Koffler, uh, assessing and reaching the last mile, making sure that the girls' and women's unique needs are captured, but also strengthening health system. Some, those are some of the contributions you made, especially in, in a crisis setting. I will head over to Mr. Steiner. As we know, UNDP and the Global Fund have been working for a long time in crisis and post-crisis settings, together as part of a partnership for more than two decades, I will even say. What are some of the few key examples that you can share with us of fighting infectious disease effectively during sensitive time like crisis? Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure, but also a very exciting moment to join you, Peter, and many others on this uh, critical milestone in the Global Fund. And as you said, we have been partners for many years, partly because we address some of those challenges that uh, Dr. Koffler was just speaking about. How do you ensure, for example, in a crisis context, that you can... Oh, yes. How do you ensure 
that you're able to deal with the disruption in government services, for example. So last year in August, um, when Afghanistan went into free fall, literally on every front uh, from the health sector, government infrastructure, central bank, it was the Global Fund that then asked UNDP, which was in Afghanistan, had worked for a number of years together, to step in in order to provide some stipends to 26,000 health workers to creep or to keep a health infrastructure going while the international community began to put a response up. Sometimes it is also providing, in a sense, um, the value added of having a development program work with the Global Fund. The um, Solar for Health program, where basically in providing the infrastructure, the support in a country such as Zimbabwe for anti to then um, provide, sorry, it's not me shouting, <laughs> um, to combine that also with a way in which we six, could, six, for six, instance, six, six. We, we need to have the God of technology with us while we are trying to fix Mr. Steiner microphone. Okay, I think this one works. Perfect. Anyway, uh, cut a long story short, solar panels, antiretrovirals, they're not two parallel universes, they're being delivered to the same local health station. Mm -hmm. We can make a system work, the introduction of, for instance, digital data management in countries such as Chad and Guinea-Bissau, another two countries where we work together. That allow us to overcome, first of all, enormous challenges in working in crisis context, but secondly, also to make it more effective and ultimately also ensure that we do not miss people. And I think where we have grown together over these years, and, and I think I was reading the numbers again. I mean, just in the in the work that we have done together, and going back to um, our colleague from Ukraine, we believe we have together been able to save over 7 million lives. I mean, this is an extraordinary number and speaks to the extraordinary value of, of the Global Fund, first of all, as an expression of global solidarity with a very targeted focus. But then through the partnerships it enters into, including with UNDP, we combine the best of what we can bring to these situations. Sometimes extreme crisis, mm -hmm. extreme desperation, but we actually can save lives and contribute perhaps to rebuilding a health system, all part of our daily work. Thank you. That's really impressive, Mr. Steiner. I'm hearing 26,000 health workers supported in Afghanistan during the recent crisis. I'm hearing digital data management system established in Chad, but I'm also hearing more than 7 million lives saved in Ukraine. Those are the type of partnership and achievement that we want to celebrate, and we thank you for sharing. And now I will move to Dr. Bintou Dembele, and this time in French. Uh, Dr. Bintou, votre organisation, Arcade Santé Plus, est un acteur clé, un acteur incontournable de la lutte contre le VIH SIDA au Mali. Dites-nous un peu dans quel contexte intervenez-vous et comment est-ce que le Fonds mondial soutient votre travail? Merci. C'est un plaisir pour moi d'être avec vous cet après-midi pour vous parler de mon pays. Je suis désolée de parler français, mais j'espère être entendue. Mon pays, le Mali, est confronté depuis 2012 à une crise multidimensionnelle. Cette crise multidimensionnelle revêt différentes formes. Les politiques avec deux coups d'État successifs et un gouvernement de transition. Et les sécuritaires, les deux tiers de mon pays sont occupés par des groupes armés. Vous voyez les zones en rouge Est-ce que vous voyez les zones en rouge et en orange Ça représente deux tiers de mon pays. Et les deux tiers de mon pays sont sujets à des groupes armés qui attaquent, qui font des attaques récurrentes dans ces zones-là. J'espère que tout le monde voit. Cette crise aussi est populationnelle parce que ces attaques récurrentes font qu'il y ait des déplacements massifs des populations, déplacements internes dans les zones, dans des endroits plus sécurisés, mais externes vers les frontières du Burkina et du Niger. Cette crise est alimentaire parce que, justement, les zones du centre, les zones d'agriculture du centre sont occupées 
par les groupes armés. Cette crise est alimentaire, mais pas que. Elle est aussi environnementale. Nous avons aussi chez nous le changement climatique. Les zones désertiques du Nord sont sujets à des inondations. Cette année, il y a eu plusieurs inondations dans ces zones-là, favorisant les gîtes de larves du paludisme. Et enfin, elle est sanitaire. Nous avons une crise sanitaire au Mali. Nous avons un contexte d'urgence au Mali. Parce que figurez-vous que seulement 5% du budget d'État est investi à la santé. Pour les dirigeants de mon pays, la priorité, ce n'est certainement pas la santé. C'est acheter des armes avec nos maigres ressources pour endiguer les rébellions dans ces zones-là. Et c'est dans ce contexte-là que nous bénéficions des fonds du Fonds mondial et que les fonds du Fonds mondial servent justement à apporter les soins à des populations les plus vulnérables. Vous voyez cette carte-là Et les petits carrés que vous voyez, c'est Global Fund, Global Fund, Global Fund, Global Fund, Global Fund. C'est grâce à ce financement du Fonds mondial que nous, allons, que nous faisons la rénovation des centres de santé communautaires qui sont des initiatives des communautés elles-mêmes. C'est grâce à ce fonds fond mondial que nous arrivons à acheter des bus médicalisés, enfin, de façon ambulatoire, amener les médicaments jusqu'au dernier kilomètre, que nous arrivons à décentraliser la prise en charge jusqu'au dernier échelon, jusqu'au dernier kilomètre. Et cela a été possible parce que le fonds mondial existe. Imaginez que dans ce chaos, qu'on n'est pas le fonds mondial. Qu'est-ce qui se serait passé C'est une question qui, je pense, garde tout le monde en émoi. Et je veux certainement revenir vous redonner la parole. Mais cette image que vous avez partagée, elle est très évocatrice. Elle est très évocatrice et elle permet à cette audience de toucher du doigt la crise que vous avez mentionnée, être sécuritaire être sanitaire, être alimentaire, être environnemental, être migratoire et plus. Nous y reviendrons. I would like to turn to Minister Thiago and uh, we would love to know in in addition of the global pandemic which we are all experiencing unfortunately Uh, your beautiful country has recently experienced cyclones. And we would love to know how have these catastrophes affected local health system, and how has your country responded and collaborated with the emergency funding from the Global Fund? Over to you. Uh, allow me first to thank the Global Fund for the invitation to be here but also thank you and Global Fund again uh, to be part of this panel with such top-class audience. Mozambique, similar to what she said, is a country prone to natural disasters. And they do appear in a form whether of cyclones, floods, or uh, drought. Uh, as an example, Only in the first quarter of this year, four cyclones passed through Mozambique. And the impact, I cannot tell you in terms of total number of infrastructure that have been destroyed, but in the health sector alone, uh, 95 health facilities have been destroyed only this year. But also, uh, uh, it takes a lot of people displaced uh, internally. Sometimes they go to other countries. On top of that, uh, as from uh, 2017, the northern province of Cabo Delgado is facing terrorist attacks with the destruction of at least uh, 32 health facilities. But due to insecurity, 
those health facilities that they are there, they cannot provide health services. <laughs> In Cap del Gado alone, more than 800,000 uh, uh, people have been displaced. You imagine the suffering and the pain that these people they suffer. As a consequence, health services have been affected. So together with the Global Fund, we could not use the same strategy that we use in normal conditions when it, uh, looking at crisis, whether by natural disasters or those uh, human-made disasters. Uh, what we did essentially was to uh, innovate. What kind of strategy could be uh, taken into account in order to provide uh, one, at least basic health service for the population, but also to keep the gains that we had with regard to malaria, HIV, and tuberculosis. What we did essentially was taking into account that Global Find, it's a long-term uh, uh, partner, and communication with us has played a, a, a key role in the process. What we did was to first to adopt the strategy in order to reallocate uh, the existing funds in the country to make sure that we could address the issue in terms of emergency. But also, we have here to thank Global Fund because they allow us to have additional funds in order to address these emergencies in our country. Thank you very much, Minister Thiago. And I'm hearing some similarities here in terms of the impacts of you know, cyclones and crises uh, in Mozambique, both on the health side, security, migration, environmental. But you also focused on the power of strategy, the power of planning, the power of action, and keeping a continuous dialogue with partners to mobilize additional resources. And those are key lessons that we are all learning for the next steps. And coming to you, Mr. Callahan, your organization is very active all over the world and working on emergency response and recovery. So why is it so important for Catholic Relief Service to partner with the Global Fund? Thank you. As you said, Catholic Relief Services works in over 100 countries around the world, and um, we've been working with the Global Fund since the inception, and we currently work in 27 countries with the Global Fund. And we combine our activities with the Global Fund with our multi-sectoral activities, reaching out uh, to various groups. 60% are focused on health, but in many areas of agriculture, climate, uh, microfinance, and others. And there's really three reasons why we've developed our relationship with the Global Fund. The first one is to protect and save lives, you know, a key, key point, um, and make sure that we have equitable access to services that are out there and to support systems in the countries in which we work that can eliminate malaria, HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis. But the special sauce in all this is local leadership and the way the Global Fund stimulates us to work with community-based organizations and also combine that with local government and international actors. So the key thing when we see that is, we talked a little bit earlier about that last mile. The last mile is really with those local community-based organizations that can have that outreach. We've talked in previous panels about bias. Besides the bias that impacts this, is access to it. And so those who are in the most isolated areas, we need to work with the civil service organizations, faith-based groups, and others so that we can do that outreach with the local organizations. We need to make sure that they have ownership of it so that there's a staying power and we don't slide back when there's a drop in, in funding and all. And we need to make sure that they feel the trust that we have in them so that they move forward. The third and really key element of working with the Global Fund is results. The Global Fund de delivers results, and it allows us to go to scale. And so when we talk about scale, it's wonderful to do development projects and health projects and reach a little community, but we need to cover countries in these areas. We need to cover regions and continents if we're gonna push back these diseases. So, that is really the key. And just a little example, CRS alone working with the Global Fund, we've distributed 
160 million bed nets. And what does that mean? We heard earlier in the presentations today, it means that 50% of the children in Sierra Leone now do not get malaria. 60% in Guinea do not um, re, you know, get malaria now, and so they now can have those healthy lives. So the real reasons we work with the Global Fund, it's verifiable, it combines uh, local governments with local communities and international actors, and it works. And it works, and it will continue to work because of a strong partnership and collaboration. I will go back to Minister Thiago and Dr. Dembele. First, Minister Thiago, you know that there are considerable risks and challenge when delivering life-saving health services or interventions in the midst of an ongoing emergency. Could you share some specific ways, for example, based your experience, on how external partners can more effectively support efforts addressing those risks? Thank you for this important question. Uh, let me, before I uh, answer the question direct that you are placing now, I'm going to put a few examples in terms of collaboration between uh, uh, Global Fund and the government of Mozambique in providing results in health. Uh, take into account that the province of Cap Delgado, the one affected by terrorist attack, uh, the amount of the, the pop, uh, displaced the population is huge, almost a quarter of its population. Uh, what we did is how can we best provide malaria solution in terms of uh, uh, decreasing the impact of the disease, the burden of the disease in that population. So with uh, uh, additional funding from Global Fund of more than 6.5 million, we started a new strategy in terms of prevention, which is mass drug administration. As a result, uh, implemented in at least two districts that they have the majority of people dis uh, displaced in the, uh, from their home, we uh, uh, realized that this uh, reduced uh, malaria prevalence in those districts, despite the fact that they are not in their own houses. This is an example uh, of collaborating between uh, uh, institutions in order to achieve results. Uh, going to your uh, uh, final question, uh, uh, what we do think is government and uh, any other agents, including a, a Global Fund, we should work together for a common vision. If we do so, then we can do any kind of strategy, any kind of action to have the best result for the population. At least what we need is to have a population healthier with less prevalence of HIV, AIDS, and malaria, and hopeful to have no malaria, no HIV, no AIDS by 2030. Thank you. Indeed, that's the goal, and that's the reason why we are here, ending those three diseases by or before 2030. Dr. Dembele, je reviens vers vous très rapidement pour vous poser la même question. Le travail que vous faites actuellement au Mali, euh, je suis sûre, pour fournir la, les services de santé aux, aux personnes vulnérables, vient avec beaucoup de risques. Et vous en avez déjà parlé au cours de votre première intervention. Vous pouvez, pouvez vous partager avec nous, avec quelques exemples spécifiques, les moyens par lesquels les partenaires ici présents et même ceux qui nous suivent de façon virtuelle peuvent soutenir plus efficacement votre effort. Travailler avec euh, une organisation de la société civile au Mali est une stratégie qui est efficace parce que cette stratégie permet d'avoir directement l'argent et de le distribuer aux organisations à base communautaire. Ils sont des organisations identitaires, des organisations de TS, des organisations de personnes usagères de drogues injectables. La communauté est au centre de nos interventions. Et ça, c'est une stratégie qui est efficace, qui a prouvé son efficacité. Les pères éducateurs, les membres des associations de personnes vivant avec le VIH SIDA sont nos bénéficiaires directs. Elles sont à la fois actrices et bénéficiaires des interventions. Et ça, c'est une stratégie qui est gagnant-gagnant pour la communauté. Et c'est ça qui est important dans un pays en crise comme le Mali, Ça, c'est vraiment une expérience à encourager. Et dans la sous-région aussi. 
Et j'invite le Fonds mondial à, à soutenir ces stratégies-là, à travailler avec nous dans ce contexte difficile-là, parce que nous sommes très proches des populations qui nous servent. Et je pense que le Fonds mondial vous a entendu. Je vois Mr. Peterson qui était très intéressé par votre recommandation et je pense qu'il a entendu ce que vous venez de suggérer. Uh, Dr. Koffler, Mr. Steiner and Mr. Callahan, uh, very briefly, your co-panelists from Mozambique and Mali, they shared some of the challenges that they are facing, especially during crisis situation on how we can partner and work better effectively. Can you respond to their comment? I will start with Dr. Koffler. It's even hard to respond because if you hear the challenges uh, which were expressed, it's of course showing one thing, how important the Global Fund is. And it's um, offering such a big variety of possibilities to support various countries mm -hmm. and offering not one size fits all, but tailor-made solutions, which are then really helping on the ground, like it was explained from the example from Mali, for example. And that's something which for us as a government is important because then we, it's about results. Then it's, a, it's about the, having an approach to really reach the people on the ground. That's not such an easy thing to do. So you need a partner like the Global Fund to fund and then government and civil society, you really have a tool to reach and make a difference. And I think that's something to take away for, for governmental decisions mm -hmm. to really see that at that point um, and that's one thing which my government really wants to do because we are not only trying to finance the global fund but also to support to implement what the fund is doing and what the fundraising and the funds are offering so we're trying to support partner countries then in implementing the fund on the ground and I think that's something which is very much needed and I'm sure we will come back to this commitment from your government uh, Mr. Steiner You know, sometimes listening to our fellow panelists, the realities are so extremely diverse. Um, you know, the, the situation last August in Afghanistan, almost unimaginable. Overnight, an entire system collapses. Um, the example of Mali, over many years, an erosion of state presence, uh, basic services, mm -hmm. the, the things that people, in a sense, would expect to be provided by a government ceasing to, to function and into that, uh, this enormous insecurity coming, which, for example, for many of our colleagues who work in the field, becomes a matter of risk and uh, risk to life also in being able to deliver this. So um, the ability of our uh, partnerships to work with the Global Fund and ensure, first of all, from something as basic as maintaining a reliable supply chain. And if you are an HIV, um, patient who requires antiretrovirals, you can't just suddenly have an interruption for six months and then resume. Um, this is why, you know, sometimes the logistics also, which is not necessarily the most exciting part of the daily work, is also a backbone for the Global Fund to be able to deliver on such a scale. Secondly, it is the people that become part of that delivery partnership, right down to the local nurse, but also the doctors, um, the government offices that ensure that you know, drugs are supplied on time. Sometimes all of this is happening in the middle of a war um, where literally people risk their lives to drive out to rural health centers. Um, and then the ability also to identify those who need the medicines most or the treatments most. Um, you know, it is easier in a country that has a good database, you're registered in hospitals, we're often working in context and with the Global Fund in particular, where you don't even know where to start. Where do you find the people who most urgently need help? Mm -hmm. Or how do you assist them in finding that support? Mm -hmm. So I think these are you know, the very practical realities of, of helping the Global Fund to succeed in two ways. One, this extraordinary idea of a world coming together on something that it actually can solve. And secondly, to deal with, um, in a sense, that ability to deliver results that Seth, you were speaking to, because it is making a difference every day to millions of people across the planet. And that's an extraordinary tribute. So to all of those who make the Global Fund come alive, congratulations.
indeed Mr. Steiner, people, partnership, process, and planning drive results. Those are your suggestions. Let me come to Mr. Callahan very briefly to comment on the two co-panelists. First, I'd just like to say that uh, Dr. Dembele and local organizations in Mali, in the Sahel, are absolutely courageous. And they allow all of us to continue to do the work when governments can't get out there and international actors can't. And I think that's where the Global Fund has showed boldness and courage in making sure that we can continue to access areas that are not accessible by many governments at different times, that we can reach the refugees, that we can reach the internally displaced and transient people that are going on. As Dr. Baltel said before, it can't be one size fits all. We have to be flexible, but we have to integrate the local people because when places close down because of COVID, they were still there. When the violence goes on, they are still there. So we need to unite the governmental effort with the international effort of the Global Fund with the local community organizations. Thank you for re reinforcing some of the statements, some of the statements made by the, by the previous panelists. I do have one minute to wrap up this panel, but I will not uh, stop this panel be, 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 be without hearing your final words. And those final words and final messages are so important to all of you in this audience. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Dembele, and this time again in French. Dr. Dembele, mais très rapidement, 30 secondes. Est-ce que vous avez un dernier mot de clôture pour l'audience avant la séance d'annonce de promesse de dons qui se tiendra le 21 septembre? En une phrase ou en un mot. Financer le Fonds mondial, c'est sauver le Mali, sauver mon pays. Donc, je lance un cri de cœur aux ah, donateurs okay. pour qu'ils puissent financer le Fonds mondial. Ah, et je pense dans mes prières que Dieu bénisse le Fonds mondial et les donateurs. Amen. Je vous remercie, Dr. Dembélé. Ça s'applaudit. Financer le Fonds mondial, c'est sauver le monde, c'est sauver l'humanité, comme le dit Dr. Dembélé. Uh, Mr. Callahan, now over to you for a short final message. Well, we, we have been working with the Global Fund for 20 years, and since 2017, we have committed in a program called Crush Malaria uh, to invest in the Global Fund, and each replenishment, we have continued to do that. So we have seen that these investments that we've made and other local actors made, that those investments make a difference and help elevate the Global Fund. These investments work and help us move forward, and all of our partners and our uh, network of systems wants to make sure that we, that we reach that $16 billion as we move forward. And so we would just ask everyone to join us in this effort. Thank you, Mr. Callahan. So let's join the Global Horn and all partners for this effort, as Mr. Callahan just said. Mr. Steiner, for your final message. You know, at a moment when literally the world is in trouble with itself, peoples with each other, wars, famines, recessions, climate change, wars, more displaced people this year than we have had since 1945 where the refugees are internally displaced people. It's easy to lose confidence and faith in the ability of people to see the value of helping each other. I think the Global Fund is an expression of exactly the opposite. So let's celebrate it later this week as an antidote to all those who keep on saying people don't care about each other, people only want to compete with each other. The Global Fund is the exact opposite of that and it is proving it every day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steiner. Mr. Thiago, Minister Thiago. Thank you. The message is for the donors. If you provide 18 billion to Global Fund, Global Fund, Mozambique as a country is going to achieve the goal of zero malaria, zero TB, and zero tuberculosis in 2020. Thank you, Minister Thiago. Over to you, Dr. Koffler. Well, um, it was all said a lot, it's about structure, it's about a systematic change and approach that we can offer. It's about people-centered approach, especially also to women and girls. And I think it was mentioned by all the colleagues on the panel, we have to finance the fund. 
And that's why I'm very proud that I can, um, it was already announced by my government that we will support the fund with 1.3 uh, billion. So we, um, I'm, not I'm not feeling the energy in the room. I'm not feeling the energy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the yes. That what it is. <laughs> so that's an easy applause for me now. <laughs> sure. No, but we really want to do it because, like it was mentioned by Mr. Steiner, it's about global solidarity. Uh, living in a world where everybody has the right, the right on a healthy future, and we want to support that. This distinguished speakers, distinguished panelists, distinguished participants, this has been such an incredibly insightful conversation, moving conversation. We have heard experiences uh, from Mali. We have heard experiences from Mozambique, but also UNDP, government of Germany, and, and CRS, they share the work and experience with us. This is a really important conversation, and it is not ending. It is just the start. Because we need to fight for what counts in terms of crisis, besides terms of crisis, and we need to make sure that this topic and our work remain relevant and timely. Let's aim for zero HIV, zero TB, zero malaria, zero AIDS, and let's fund the global fund. Yes, I'm repeating myself. Let's fund the global fund, and let's fund the future. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much, Dr. Joanne Bewa. 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 Thank you very it as a partner rather than a donor, almost as a savior in some countries, and as an antidote, we've just heard from the head of the UNDP. But now let's invite on stage the gentleman who, for the last few years, has been in charge of piloting what the Global Fund does with the billions of pounds that are raised every three years, and of which 18 or so more billion will be raised on Wednesday, pledged and delivered. Please welcome the Executive Director of the Global Fund, Mr. Peter Sands. Yeah. Top man, how are you doing? Good to see you, right, man. Fantastic stuff. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this has been a fantastic afternoon. And actually, it's very humbling to be in my role as the executive director of the Global Fund because it is such an extraordinary partnership. But let me. Let me come back to one number, 50 million lives. It's hard to get your head around a number like that. It's nearly the population of Kenya. It's twice the population of Australia. It's almost five times the population of Sweden, many more times the population of Ireland. But what really matters is that every one of these lives saved is a person. 
a mother, a father, a son or daughter, a colleague or a friend. People, people like Shani Ali, a woman living with HIV who I met a few days ago in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Shani is 39 and she's been on antiretroviral treatment for 18 years. She's married and a mother of three. Both her husband and children are HIV negative. It's a happy family. Shani's story is worth telling. When she was 14, Shani's parents decided to marry her off to a man 21 years older than she was. Within three months, she was pregnant. On her first antenatal visit, she tested positive for HIV. When Shani told this shocking news to her husband, he accused her of being unfaithful. And her family and friends believed his false accusations. Stigmatized, scorned, she descended into depression. She was so ill, she had a miscarriage. She even planned to end her life. From this dreadful place to where she is now, a healthy woman, a mother, a wife, is an extraordinary journey. And it's one that started with Shani visiting a clinic, starting counseling, and later being put on HIV treatment. It's stories like Shani's that bring to life the human reality of the progress we've made against HIV, TB, and malaria. But the same such stories also reveal the devastating knock-on impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Take Honduras. Over the last 20 years, Honduras had succeeded in reducing malaria cases by over 95% and was well on track towards elimination. But the pandemic, plus extensive flooding from tropical storms, led to a sharp resurgence. Cases of malaria nearly tripled between 2019 and 2020. Still small numbers compared to elsewhere in the world, but indicative of how malaria isn't beaten until it is totally beaten, and how quickly it can come back. Together, we fought back against COVID-19. With the support of generous donors, the Global Fund has awarded more than $4.4 billion to help countries and communities respond to the pandemic, mitigate its impact on life-saving HIV, TB, and malaria services, and make urgent improvements to health systems. While the global results we released last week show the scale of the setbacks due to COVID-19, they also demonstrate how much we've been able to support countries to rebound and recover lost progress. Take Bangladesh. In 2020, the number of people treated for TB fell by 20% to 230,000 as COVID-19 disrupted services, diverted resources. That means the number of people undiagnosed and untreated for TB in Bangladesh increased by about 60,000. Yet in 2021, through extraordinary efforts of communities, civil society, and the government, the number of people treated had rebounded to more than 300,000, an all-time high. 
whether in Tanzania, Honduras, or Bangladesh, our success in fighting the three diseases is rooted in this diverse and vibrant partnership. Communities, governments, the private sector, civil society, technical partners, all, all of you here today. There's, there's nothing quite like it in global health or in the broader development or humanitarian space. By engaging this breadth of partners, including most crucially the communities and people most directly affected in every aspect of our performance and delivery, we can work magic. Magic that saves lives. Magic that can beat even the most formidable diseases. Right now, we need all of the adaptability and resilience, the sheer passion of our unique partnership more than ever. COVID-19 is still far from over. Brutal conflicts expose millions to infectious disease, particularly TB. Global food and energy shortages make the poorest and most marginalized even more vulnerable to deadly pathogens. In Ukraine, we have seen destruction of hundreds of health facilities and with millions forced to flee. But as Valeria so vividly described, we have also seen an extraordinary response. Civil society implementers such as 100% Life have shown incredible flexibility and courage to sustain life-saving services. The Global Fund moves swiftly to reprogram existing resources and provide extra funding. Working with partners such as PEPFAR, WHO, we stepped in to ensure the continued supply of vital medicines. History tells us that most wars, most conflicts kill more people through infectious disease than by bullets and bombs. What's happening in Pakistan right now shows us that climate change has a similar dynamic, fueling and exacerbating infectious disease threats. We must respond to these crises with speed, with flexibility, with humanity. And we must also invest to build resilience, strong systems for health, including robust and vigorous community systems can better withstand and respond to such shocks. We must also make real the commitment to leave no one behind. Unless we tackle the gender inequalities and human rights related barriers that continue to drive these pandemics, we will not succeed. 20 years ago, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria looked unbeatable. But together, we changed the story. We refused to accept that millions should die of diseases that were preventable and treatable. We united the world to fight for what counts. Over the last two decades, the three diseases have been stopped in their tracks. We've saved 50 million lives. We've built healthier communities, stronger economies. But our progress is fragile. COVID-19 has shown how quickly we can be knocked back. With adversaries as formidable as HIV, TB, and malaria, there is no middle ground. We are either winning or we're losing. So this is the crunch point. The choice is stark. We either step up funding and intensify our efforts, all give up 
on the SDG3 target of finally defeating these pandemics by 2030? From a human perspective, the right answer is obvious. So many lives are at stake. From an economic perspective, the argument is equally compelling. The return on investment from beating these diseases is incredibly high. This week, as we all know, President Joe Biden is hosting the Global Fund's seventh replenishment with the aim of raising at least $18 billion to fund the next three years of the Global Fund Partnership's work. As others have said earlier this afternoon, this is quite simply a matter of life and death. With $18 billion, we could save 20 million lives over the next three years. We could cut the annual death toll from HIV, TB, and malaria by almost two-thirds. These are staggering numbers. This is an extraordinary prize. We would also make everyone in the world safer by strengthening health and community systems, making them more inclusive and resilient, better able to prevent, detect, and respond to future infectious disease threats. Let me finish by coming back to Shani. After Shani got treatment, she met the man who would become her new husband and father of her children. But when they first met, Shani was hesitant to date him, knowing she was living with HIV. So she told him. Shani's doctor explained to them that if Shani stuck to her treatment, they could live as a couple and even have children. And that's what they did. Today, Shani and Juma Omar have three children, two boys and a girl, all HIV negative. Actually, I met Sanifa, Shani's six-year-old daughter, sparkling and smart, just like her mother. When we are talking about fighting for what counts, this is what counts. It's enabling Shani to have a happy and HIV-free family. It's stopping girls and women like Shani or Sanifa from getting HIV in the first place. So let's fight for what counts together. Together, we can do it. Together, we must do it. The moment is now. Well done, Peter. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. One more time for Mr. Peter Sands, the Executive Director of the Global Fund. Thank you very much. Brilliant. A real clarion call for what we're going to do on Wednesday. And now, here we are in Gotham. I now have the honour of introducing the Mayor of the great city of New York, this concrete jungle where dreams are made of, where there's nothing you can't do. You see where I'm going here? He is Mayor Eric Adams. Please welcome him to the stage. Great to meet you. What should know about this? <laughs> I know that song. I used to play it all on the radio all the time. Great to see you here. Thank you. To, to Peter, what a powerful, powerful visual and audio presentation of why we're here. And I handed my prepared notes to my staff because I wanted to just end with a three-minute story. It was while I was campaigning to become a state senator, not the mayor. It was a cold night. 
the weather was, try was trying to determine if it was going to snow or sleet, and I was driving down the parkway going to see my mother around 2 a.m. in the morning. Mom has six children. She loves them all, but she adores me. <laughs> and as I pulled off the exit of the highway, there was a vehicle on the side of the road. The hood was up. I stopped and pulled over it and asked the gentleman who was there. He had his little baby in the back seat with his wife. And he stated that his alternator killed his battery and he needed a boost. I pulled up next to his car, pulled out my battery cables, and we did not have a flashlight to hook up the terminals. Pulled out a book of matches. Tried to light the first book, the wind blew it out. The second match, the wind blew it out. The third, the fourth, the sixth. Finally, I remember when my dad used to smoke, he would cuff the match so the wind couldn't blow it out and the flame wouldn't extinguish. We hooked up the cables. It took about 13 matches to do so. He drove off and I sat there holding the book of matches. Each match was representative of who we are as human beings. Our flames won't light forever. Our flame will light for just a small period of time. And the question is, what are we going to do with our flame? Are we going to be like Peter and light the pathway? Or will we be emotional arsonists and burn the dreams of others and watch them go up in smoke? But what was significant about the month and the, the match was that the first match that lit did not see the completion of the task. The goal is not to see the task completed. The goal is to start the task so the other matches and the other people will continue on. This global fund This fund is so significant. And remember what happened when I didn't realize that the wind was blowing out the mattress? You remember what I did? I cuffed them. I cuffed the flame. That young lady, flame was flickering. It was about to prematurely extinguish because she was either going to take her life or not have the resources that were available. You cuffed her. You hugged her. You stopped the winds of adversity from predetermining her destination and blowing out her flame. We have billions of people that are waiting to be cuffed that are waiting for the funds. And to my donors, it is a blessing to live rich. It's a sin to die rich. Write another check. <laughs> Write another check. We need to reach these dollar amounts. We need to make